Welcome to Human's Magic. My guest this week is Alex Bernchini. Alex is a Star City Games grinder, a magic player, and someone who is banned from magic. In 2011, Alex was caught on camera during a Star City Games feature match, deliberately cheating with the two explorers, and he served an 18-month suspension for that. After coming back, he was suspended a second time in 2014 and was banned for three years. Ultimately, he came back in 2017. In 2017, Alex was banned from playing Magic indefinitely. This was a very difficult interview to conduct. I wanted to talk to Alex to understand his thought process as a magic player, but especially as a cheater. I wanted to understand what went on and there have been so many secondhand accounts, so many stories and profiles on Alex. He is arguably one of the most famous people in magic ever for cheating at a high level. And I was pretty conflicted in terms of how to approach the conversation with Alex. I thought that the only way that I could do it properly was to ask the questions, just straight up ask the questions, not to let him off the hook and to go deeper into some of his answers if need be. Because everything I understand about cheaters, especially in Magic the Gathering, is that cheating requires a very or I should say cheating for a prolonged period of time, as Alex did, requires a lot of sleight of hand. Sleight of hand, not just in terms of manipulating what's on the battlefield and the cards and what cards you draw, what cards the opponent doesn't draw. Sleight of hand, not just in manipulating the rules to your advantage, but also sleight of hand in terms of being charismatic getting people to relate to you in terms of ah shucks, sympathetic. All these kinds of things allow cheaters to take advantage of other people. And don't get me wrong, it is absolutely about stealing, about taking advantage from others. Heading into this interview, I knew that I could not let Alex just get away with certain explanations, create certain narratives. It's important to hear someone's side of the story, but it's also very important not to softball it, not to let someone off the hook. I did feel conflicted because for one, Alex has a chance to speak in his voice and one could argue that he should not even be given the opportunity to do so. But on the other hand, I felt like the interview did have a tiny little bit of upside in terms of me going deep into why he did what he did and not letting him off the hook when he tried to rationalize what he did. There were certain points in the interview, you'll, if you listen to it, you'll definitely catch this, where Alex appears to contradict himself. Even when cornered, he did not really want to provide a suitable, in my opinion, explanation for what happened. It does seem to me like he's living in his own reality, and that was difficult to comprehend. And I'm not sure how it came across, but I was definitely feeling a little frustrated during the interview because there were certain parts of it that were straightforward, certain things that were layups for him to say, and certain things that were where he was quite evasive and that was challenging there. You'll notice that in some parts I let him speak in some parts I cut him off because I felt like we needed to get to some sort of point as opposed to running in circles. And I know this is a ton of preamble, but I definitely want to set that right context with you, the listener or the viewer. I came into this conversation not wanting to exonerate Alex from anything. I simply wanted to understand how a cheater at the highest levels cheated, 
you know, I wanted to understand why he did those things. I definitely was not expecting some sort of redemption story. There's nothing to be had here in terms of redemption story. He absolutely cheated and stole from those other players. It's a zero-sum game, as I had mentioned. But I was hoping that there was some rationalization, there was some sociopathic, there was some pathological reason why he did what he did. But I kind of came out of it ultimately more frustrated at this whole thing than going into it. So on the one hand, you might just listen to all this or maybe listen to the whole interview and just be thinking, James, you're silly for wanting to do this in the first place. What could Alex offer you that he hasn't already said or has, has, he hasn't already done? There's a part in the interview, you you understand as you listen to it, where I really press him to give more information about the existence of other Magic players that may also be shady. And he didn't want to do it. And I think that ultimately makes me feel like his truth is not the objective truth. And it is unusual. I'm saying a lot of stuff before going into the interview. It probably just comes off as rambling right now, but I really felt like I needed to set that right context and explain my mindset going into it. Make your own conclusions. Everything from this interview is essentially uncut. I didn't take out large chunks of it. It just happened the way it did organically. Let's get to it. This is Humans of Magic with Alex Bernchini. All right, Alex, Alex Bernchini, thanks for joining me on this uh, for this interview. How are you doing today? Oh, all right, not too bad. It's what is it? Thursday today and uh, sunny and oh wait, Friday, right? <laughs> It is. It is Friday. Yeah. Has it been a, yeah. a long week, a short week, or how how has it been? Well, the the days kind of blend together, like uh, lately. So like, um, I, they kind of did when I played Magic too. Um, you, it was kind of just like a race to the weekend. Like when was when was the next flight I would have to take, or when was the next you know, hopping in the car and going to the next tournament. You know, so um, it's kind of like every other day, kind of just is just one of the days that you're not doing it. So it's just, they're all the same. Like the Mondays and the Wednesdays are all just, you know, very, very little calendar work that I do. <laughs> yeah. Where, where about just to fill folks in, like whereabouts are you right now? And what are you up to these days? So I live uh, right outside of Austin in a little town called Pflugerville, which is like just a suburb of Austin, just to the North. And um, I play poker full time. And it's um, it's just something that I wanted to do kind of af after Magic at some point. I kind of wanted to do it even while I was playing Magic, but I never really had the time because Magic took all my time. But um, I found that Texas was rec Texas was recommended to me, so that's where I found myself. Mm -hmm. How how has the poker grind been going? I assume you're doing it full time, right? You're that's yeah. basically a like a, a job if i if i assume correctly yes it is definitely a like a, a, a full-time job i don't have any other um employment at the moment and it's uh it's very difficult it's it's kind of it's funny because there was a lot of things that i expected before i started playing poker that it would be like and it's it's kind of been a lot of those those challenges and it's been you know more challenging than i originally thought um in the areas of let's say discipline and focus studying like a lot of the areas that i thought i would struggle in poker that i guessed i would have 10 years ago i am actually s very much <laughs> struggling in and the parts that i thought would be uh easier for me like from transitioning from poker such as you know um strategy bankroll management socializing all those things were much easier just as i suspected they would be so there was a lot of um a lot of the expectations i had were met <laughs> and i thought that maybe after playing magic for so many years that i would be more mentally focused and disciplined to play this game but that's still something i'm working on <laughs> i mean 
how much study goes on f- for a professional, I'll call you a professional poker player, just in terms of playing versus studying? Is there is there a lot of studying? Because I've never I've never done poker as a as a full time thing. There there is a lot of studying, and even the amount that I study is not even close to enough. Um, that was that was actually one of the the shocking things that I didn't really understand about poker uh, compared to Magic. So for Magic, in order to get good at Magic, you just have to play a lot of Magic. Like if someone came up to me and my job was to get them better at Magic, I would say, okay, well, uh, how much are you playing Magic? How often are you playing? Are you playing online? Are you playing with friends? Are you playing for money? Uh, I would just tell them to keep playing and playing and playing. I wouldn't tell them to read a bunch of articles. I wouldn't tell them to read a bunch of theory. I wouldn't tell them to do watch a bunch of YouTube videos and lectures. I wouldn't recommend any of that for Magic. I would just tell them to play, 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 shuffle, 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 play. For poker, it's almost the opposite um, because there's so much math and um, stuff like that involved in poker. It's it's a lot less based on like let's say experience or intuition as magic is or you know r- repetition. It's more based on uh, understanding theory, game theory, and you know studying the actual things you're supposed to do with certain hands and certain positions. So because of that, you actually have to understand a lot more detailed stuff that the brain isn't very good at picking up at in game. And it has, you know, bad feedback loops and bad uh, patterns and stuff like that. So you actually have to study a lot because you're not supposed to look at what happens if you play aces a certain way after 100 hands. You're supposed to look at what happens, what you're supposed to do 100 times when you play aces. And so this goes for all the hands. So... The, the suggestion would probably be, I would say, something close to like 50-50. For if you, if you spend 40 hours a week involved in poker, you should probably spend roughly 20 hours studying and 20 hours playing. Whereas in Magic, I would say you should do 38 hours playing. You know, maybe you could watch a YouTube video of your favorite person talking about a deck or something like that. But uh, for me, I spend a lot more time playing than I do studying, which I should, you know, I, I've still been having a hard time finding that good balance that I should be doing much more studying than I have been playing. Have you found success in in uh, what you've done for poker so far, just in terms of, I don't know if you're playing cash, you're playing tournaments, some combination, like, are you, I, and I don't even know if you, if you have specific goals in poker or other than make a living. I, I don't know how you think about all of that stuff that's a good question yeah um i i have found what some people would find as success in that as in like i make i make more money than i put into it so like Mm -hmm. as far as it has been successful or has been fruitful yes it is i've made more money than i put in i play a little bit a a mix of cash and tournaments i started off playing more tournaments and now i'm leaning a little bit more playing more cash but as far as what i wanted to get out of it um I, I went into it originally with the goal that if I could show a proficiency after like a year or two of playing it, that I understood the game, that I could play the game consistently, at least I would have a fallback plan for, you know, in case any other future endeavor I wanted to do failed, I could always lean back on poker. The goal wasn't to necessarily play poker full time for the rest of my life. Um, and that that wasn't the goal. And then, after having played it, despite even being somewhat successful monetarily at it, it's definitely not something that I intend to do for the long haul, as in like, you know, in if I'm doing this full time in five years from now, I'll consider it not what I want to do. I think that would probably be like the backup fallout, a uh, fall, fallback um, plan, do you know? There was a chance. Interesting. That- yeah, yeah, there was a chance that when I got into it that I would really just love it entirely. And I'm like, okay, I want to do nothing else all day long other than study and play this game. And I do very much like it. I've enjoyed the game even more than I thought I would. But uh, but similarly, one of the things I learned from Magic was that playing a game for a living is uh, provides its own level of stress that almost counterfeits the, uh, the liberation you feel that you're playing a game for a living. You know, mm-hmm. it has to be extremely extremely stable and playing games for a living just naturally isn't very stable and poker doesn't have the word stability anywhere in it so it's it's more that like i guess i crave the freedom of playing games for a living and doing what i want for a living but 
I also crave some sort of stability and that does not come from poker. So um, I am hoping to use what I've learned from poker and magic as kind of like a, uh, kind of like a useful toolbox for future endeavors. Does that mean it's, that what you're doing right now is stressful? Extremely very, it's, it's, it's very stressful. And in m more ways than I originally thought, uh, in ways that it wasn't with magic. Um, it's just, it just because, you know, it, it, it's funny because no matter how I, uh, how one approaches it, it, it comes with some form of stress. If you approach it like gamblers do, you have a lot of stress about it from like, you know, either a societal or a monetary point of view. And if you come at it from a point of view of a strategic person, you still have a lot of, you know, pressure on your yourself and to perform and you know your own shortcomings and your own fault so whether you look at it from the most gambly gambler that hates it when his aces get cracked or when you look at whether you look at it professionally like well i understand it's going to happen 28 percent of the time i'm just going to accept that regardless of how you look at it there's always going to be stress stresses because it's almost impossible to play the game perfectly and you're going to be hard on yourself in some regard and the best players in the game the ones that make it the farthest and make it the longest after the most years aren't the players that play the game the best is the people that understand themselves and control their emotions the best and that is if there's a definition of easier said than done that is it controlling your emotions because that's just basically what you have to do you have to control you know almost like become a robot you know what i mean it's and i i found that to be very difficult for myself i kind of wear my emotions on my sleeve uh, I don't. I think I hardly have any poker face at all, which is a kind of overstated skill. But in and of itself, like you know, the poker face you have inside your own head, the the way that you're able to digest events that have happened to you, it's hard and very stressful. Regardless of whether I know in the long run I will make some money off of it. Do you still have any connection to Magic: The Gathering? I know you're banned from playing Magic competitively mm -hmm. or tournaments, but are you do you have any connection do you follow the game is it do you do any of that at all today yes yeah i do i i i follow and i keep up with uh mostly older formats and eternal formats like uh legacy vintage edh and mostly cube is what i do and i still play that once or twice a week actually at one of the local stores we have a group of people that cube draft once a week with me and it's pretty fun um i found that a lot of the uh the most fun I had in the game was actually in more casually played formats. Like I don't really miss playing standard or modern or flying to a GP and doing a draft as much as I thought I would. So yeah. And then I always, I play on magic online a lot, uh, mostly just cube and, and limited and stuff like that. But yeah, I do spend many hours a week consuming magic content or playing. Absolutely. Still. Yeah. You're definitely a, a known person in Magic the Gathering at this point. So when you play Cube or even something that's not sanctioned, I mean, what's the what's the reaction like from people that you play with? I mean, are they are they friends? Are they people at the store that happen to play? Or I guess I'm trying to figure out how your reputation does it still affect you to this day when you play poker or when you play Magic. Uh, it, it does in some ways. It I, um, almost all the players that I play with know who I am. Uh, the history of uh, from of me through Magic, regardless of where I've lived, whether it was when I was in New York or California or here in Texas, um, it turns yeah, it turns out every a lot of people know. But it wasn't as big of an issue. I think I I think I, I can't speak for how people think, but my perception is that most people, once they got to know me, they generally kind of made any kind of preconceived notion that they had i put it to the back of their head or if you know if they continue to dislike me then obviously they wouldn't you know continue to engage with me um it hasn't really followed me much into poker since there isn't actually a large overlap between let's say uh entrenched magic players and poker players living in texas playing so and that's probably similar for most places honestly the the overlap isn't you would think there'd be a larger overlap but there actually there actually isn't um the demographic for poker is is very 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 vast much more vast than magics so i would say that maybe out of uh 
uh, this is a rough number, maybe out of 100 poker players, maybe only one of them is familiar with Magic. So maybe out of, a, out of those, out of that one player, you know, how many of them would know me? Probably, let's say, 50%, maybe 25%. So it's really not very common for people to either recognize or know me fr uh, from Magic at the poker table. But any of the players that that do play, um, that, I, that I do play with, they, they all know who I am and stuff. So I've found the reception to not be negative, but that's probably just a matter of, like, people who are people will be friendly to who they're, you know, associating with. So if somebody wants to cube draft with me every week, they'll probably be friendly with me regardless of what their actual thoughts are about me. But my guess is that they put it to the side since they continue to do it. So mm -hmm. have there been any strong reactions toward you in any way, positive or negative? Uh, since the banning or like, like po post banning, I, I mean, as of today, your interactions with people at the poker table or people you play magic with? Not any, no, not any really strong um, reactions, at least public, public reactions. Um, I imagine, like, you know, I, I have to imagine that there are definitely some negative reactions to it, but like, you know, even extreme ones, but not ones that are made to my face or to my uh, public knowledge that I know of, you know, nobody's sending me, you know, chats or messages of anybody saying anything crazy or anything, but certainly nobody here says anything to your face. So, um, if there, if there are strong reactions, they're not known to me. So I can't, I definitely couldn't say there aren't, I'm sure there are some, because I, when I was playing magic, I was extremely, uh, polarizing, uh, person. So it's only makes sense that you know, even though I'm not as in the know anymore, um, it, it still makes sense that there would be uh, strong reactions to it. It hasn't had any actual ramifications yet. Like I have not been banned from anywhere or, you know, forbidden from playing in certain places because of it. And uh, I thought maybe I would just go back to the, the start. I mean, we're going to definitely go through the sequence of events. I want to ask you questions mm -hmm. about your magic career, but um, I just want to know, like, how did you even get started playing magic? Like, maybe just take me back to the the beginning and maybe when you were much younger and how did you find the game? And maybe just take me through like finding the game to actually starting to play competitively. Right, so uh, when I was younger, my uh, my parents uh, or my dad mostly, he wanted, he, he played like chess with me and video games because he saw that I enjoyed playing games. So I started, you know, as young playing just games like, like, you know, strategy games, like on the computer or chess. And from there, uh, Pokemon came out in the mid nineties, late nineties, you know, I was probably what nine or 10 when it came out and it was, you know, like addicting, like every other person loved those cards. And, uh, I collected Pokemon cards. And in middle school, I think, is when Yu-Gi-Oh! came out. And that's when I was like, okay, this is like a, this is a more fleshed out game. I didn't like the Pokemon game very much. So I moved over to Yu-Gi-Oh!, played that for a few years. And then um, right as high school, for maybe first year of high school, uh, maybe, yeah, ninth grade, I think it was, eighth or ninth grade, um, I saw my uh, some friends in school playing uh, Magic. And, you know, I saw, I remember the first couple cards I saw were these, like, you know, just basic lands, like islands and swamps and stuff. I was like, what game is this? And they're like, oh, this is Magic the Gathering. Uh, it's, like, a little bit harder than Yu-Gi-Oh! and older. And I was like, oh, okay. And I think it was, I think Invasion had just finished. So Onslaught block was the, the block that was out at the time. And uh, I was like, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll try that game. Why not, you know? So I had a friend that, you know, played Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic, and he's like, oh, I'll show you how to play Magic. Come over to my house, I'll show you how to play Magic. So he did, and um, I started playing Magic. Like, I just played a few games. Like, wow, this game is really cool. And I just fell in love with it there. And so from that day on, I just started, I, I quit Yu-Gi-Oh! I was just, just all Magic at that point. And I was like, okay, um, where can I play this game? So I went to, like, the local card stores around, in, you know, in New York, uh, right above the city, about 30 minutes north. And I would play at these little, like, card stores that had these small, small tournaments. And from there is when I started, you know, getting, you know, interested in tournaments. 
because it was like, okay, well, you, you enter, you pay whatever it was, five or ten bucks, and then you would win some store credits and packs or whatever. And it was cool because that was like a a competitive outlet. I, I actually enjoyed playing the game and competing. So that was kind of where I learned that I enjoyed not just uh, playing games, but I also enjoyed competing in them and trying to like win a prize, you know, whatever uh, that is. Uh, so I started, uh, at that point I started playing it and tried taking it a little bit more seriously. I remember looking at the Scry magazine and Inquest and stuff like that. They had deck techs and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, cool. Wow, there's people that put like a lot of thought into this game. It was much more fleshed out than like Yu-Gi-Oh, which had just come out or the Pokemon game. Like it was immediately in depth. So I knew as soon as I started playing it that I was only going to play Magic. I didn't really care about any other card games or any other really, any other games really. I didn't play very many video games. I just kind of was obsessed with Magic from a, an early an early point and i would travel to the city uh there was a store called neutral ground that used to be around a lot of you know big name pros came out of there like you know um john finkel steve oms a lot of the best players from the northeast played at neutral ground uh frequently and i would travel around and start playing in ptqs in uh you know new jersey connecticut new york a lot of very hard uh tournaments and that's kind of what uh started started me off into magic was traveling for tournaments and uh you know it, it happened very fast i'd say probably over three about three years after i started like the picked up my first magic card three years later i was you know driving eight hours for a ptq or seven hours you know it, for a star city games tournament and stuff like that kind of that's how it started around what year did you start playing the star city games tournaments uh i believe the first they they had um i remember i played the the their, their second tournament ever their second 5k's what they were called star Stadium's 5k's they had they were in uh, virginia and i played the second one and the third one they had a weekend that they that they had two and it was 2000 and i want to say 2007 i believe 2007 or 2008 yeah, it's some, it was something like that. It was it was it was in one of those two years, two thousand seven or two thousand eight. I think it was two thousand seven, and that was the those that series that that tournament series that they were holding was the first time, at least that I'm aware, that they started that, that was like the equivalent of um, I know their terms. It was almost like the equivalent of like cash games and poker. Like there was like there was a, it was a non-established scene where you just show up and played for cash. Like it wasn't there was no pro tour invite. There was no buys. It was just kind of a, you know, sit down, enter, pay your entry fee it was twenty dollars at the time, and then win cash. And uh, there was a trophy involved and stuff like that. And it was just different than a Grand Prix, which you know were rotating formats and a lot of limited, which I enjoyed constructed more than limited. And I, I wanted a chance to just like sit down, play Magic, and win money. Like that was just kind of like a cool thing to me. Um, so. Yeah, as soon as I played that, whatever, the second event, and I, I won it, and as soon as that happened, I really, that's, like, what really started me, like, started the fire. Like, that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to travel to all of these, and I want to, you know, play as much as I possibly can to get better at it. Mm -hmm. uh, were you a student at the time? Were you, uh, what around what age were you back then? I think you were... How old are you now? You're in your mid-30s, right? Yes. So at that time, I was 17 or 18. Yeah, so I was, like, it was, you know, I was just leaving high school and starting college. And I even, um, so when I had gone to college, I I wasn't really, I didn't really want to go as much. My parents kind of insisted, <laughs> for, for lack of a better term. Um, but I found myself way too involved with magic to you know focus on studying and doing any of that stuff i i really didn't have still to this day have no passion for for studying and schoolwork and that whole system the whole system is was not a good a good mix with me even the end result like i working traditional jobs was just something that i never and i worked plenty of them over the years um i worked everything from cashiers and hotel front desks to management positions and even in game design. And I just always found working that uh, working traditional jobs wasn't a good mix for me. So going to school was also, it felt like one of those, 
things that led to the inevitable nine to five job, whether it's good or good or bad, you know, um, wasn't really the point. It was more just, you know, part of me wonders, you know, looking, part of, looking back now at the time, all I want to do is play magic, but looking back at it now, I wonder how much of it was me not, me really not enjoying or meshing well with school versus me just wanting to play magic because I was young and I just couldn't focus on anything else other than magic. So yeah, I was a student at the time. Um, when I was in high school, I was traveling on the weekends to play magic here and there. But when I was in college, I would, I would also do the same thing. And my schoolwork suffered and I didn't really pay attention to it. So I ended up dropping out uh, after a year and a half and just doing magic instead uh, full time. Uh, and that was okay. around 2009 at that point was when I dropped out of college. Yeah, 2009 for sure. So, yeah, because the system wasn't really set up and fleshed out just yet. They were just kind of like, you know, it was start, Star Wars games was starting to get really popular at that time. So it was actually, it was ironically a good a good time to get into being a professional Magic player, full-time player, but it was still shaky as far as like, you know, if you take a step back and look at it from like a perspective of this is how you want to structure your life and make something of yourself or be whatever the definition of success is. This was still a very treacherous road. The numbers mm -hmm. weren't good. Mm -hmm. that, you know? Right. So in the first couple of years playing in the Star City Games circuit, did you develop any relationship with SCG or SCG employees or just a coverage team or like, because I think you became kind of a regular, right? Like going to all of the, the tournaments. So describe that early 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 days experience or early years and maybe your relationship with scg if if any yeah so like you said i was definitely a regular um i was one of the people that showed up and traveled to their events so they started having their events in different locations across the country um originally they were just having a few tournaments in in virginia which is where where they were located but then they started moving you know they had tournaments in texas and florida and california and so as they went to different tournaments, there was a group of players that would travel and play their series, you know, um, and that was probably maybe eight or 10 of us total. So all of us, myself included, definitely developed a, a camaraderie with these with these uh, either employees, sellers, coverage staff, judges, other players that we had seen. Uh, yeah, we all definitely not only created a camaraderie with them, but also were seen almost like us, uh, like, you know, magic celebrities in a way, because while there was, there's still like the professional level events, like, you know, the, the, the Grand Prix circuit, the Grand Prix circuit wasn't as accessible to more, most people because, you know, many of the events were overseas. So at least domestically, we were like, players that you would see more often you would you would enter more events with me in them than you would with lsv in them so it, it, in a way myself and a few of the other scg pros we were kind of like how as household name as it got especially in the united states um and yeah so we developed a, we spent a lot of time and developed relationships with all sorts of people um scg staff uh players and coverage yeah yeah. What about the other, uh, you said eight or 10 SCG grinders or, or pro players, right? Did you mm -hmm. develop friendships or relationships with folks that you saw every weekend as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I would say, yeah, we were all, there was a, what was called the players club, which was a, a level of one through eight. And depending on how, where you fell in this, uh, players club, you would get certain rewards or benefits. I think level one was, uh, like free entry to the event and then all the way up to level eight, which was uh, you got four of every standard set they got came out plus all the other benefits like uh, an appearance fee, free entry to the event, blah, 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 blah. Sleeves, I think. Yeah. So um, players that were in this players club were you, you basically be in this based on how much you played or how many of these events you played in. So I would say that myself and the other players that were in the level six and plus six, seven and eight, we pretty much all were um, close friends with each other. Um, 
I would I would say at the time, yeah, all, all of us, like we all had either a mutual respect or like, a, you know, certainly a mutual understanding of what the the grind and we were going through was because we all were in the same room every weekend. And, you know, we were all, you know, playing, playing a lot of magic and, you know, um, really, really doing the whole like practicing, practice, practice, play, play a lot of magic over and over and over again. We were playing a lot of magic. And, you know, it was even in between rounds of a tournament, I'd be playing Magic. I wouldn't even be taking a break in between games. I would just be playing more Magic. And, you know, on the airplane, if I was flying with somebody, we'd be playing Magic on the, you know, fold-out trays. So, you know, it was just like, yeah, nonstop. And when I got home, it would be Magic, Magic, Magic. So it was definitely a, a, a display, not just myself, but all of us players in that in that group. It was a display of how playing a lot of magic could just make you better whether it's through osmosis or through repetition whatever it was we all just got much better at the game just by playing high stakes every weekend take me through the first time that you decided to cheat mm. in a tournament game it's funny because i don't remember the very first the very first time um I I don't remember it being like a cognizant thought that I thought ahead of or thought of in the moment, but there was a point where I wasn't cheating and then there was a point where I was. So I can't, t I, I don't, I legitimately don't remember. I couldn't tell you an event or a game. I, I don't even know if I could tell you a year in which was the first time that it, that I, because I'm trying to figure out, maybe this is a leading question, but I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out if there was like a moment when the stakes were high. Was it like there must have been something that triggered that initial uh, decision to bend the rules to your advantage? So I want to know, like, right. was there was there was it like playing for something with stakes or like there had to be something, right? Yes, yes. Um, I would say that the the general impetus for me to cheat in general came at it came the most when i thought it was opportune so if i saw an opportunity that was that was more the, the triggering thing rather than necessarily the stakes um the way that the the point system worked in Star City Games, all the you you would get accumulation total of points based on the events. So if you didn't get enough points this week, you could get more points next week. But the points this week were just as valuable as the points next week. So it wasn't necessarily the stakes didn't necessarily get higher as the season went on. The stakes were always on from week one to just accumulate points. So the tournaments, whether it was round one or whether it was round nine playing for top eight, the stakes were always equally high i would i would say relatively equally high obviously you're gonna get more stress when you're nine and one than when you're zero and zero but for the most part it was it was definitely a, a constant state of stress so the conditions that i found myself cheating the most often during were instances where i believed i could get away with whatever it was i was doing so I would never show up to a tournament, you know, with like Mark sleeves or a Mark deck or like, okay, well, how am I going to cheat today? Like that was never this, that was never um, a conversation I had with myself, but it was definitely one that I didn't necessarily need to have with myself at the time of doing it either. So for instance, let's say there was an opportunity to, you know, uh, uh, we'll go play an extra land, right? So if, if there was an opportunity to play an extra land where if I get caught playing the extra land, the punishment for playing the extra land would, I mean, it might not even be a warning. It might just be, oh, you already play land this turn. Oh, I'm sorry. Pick it back up. Or you just get to play the extra land. Um, so in my head, it wasn't necessarily like, oh, well, this matches for $1,000 and I need these points really badly and I don't want to have flown all the way over here. So I'm going to, I need to figure out a way to cheat. I need to figure out a way to play an extra land. It was more just like, can I play an extra land here? Okay, play an extra land. Or like, mm -hmm. whatever, insert X, you know, tap two white mana to cast a card that costs three white mana. Do you know what I mean? Like whatever, insert whatever um, 
thing there. But it wasn't. But yeah, we, weirdly enough, like I, I think that the thing that was different about my cheats than other ones was because because they were opportunistic in nature, they were much easier for me to get away with. Like for instance, a shuffle cheater. If you catch, if you're, they're hard to catch. But if you catch a shuffle cheater, there isn't a, oh, oops, like there isn't a any potential like you know recourse to that. You catch someone with marked sleeves, they they mark their Tron lands or whatever. That's game over. Like you you know that that person showed up there to cheat. But if somebody that you see every week and you're friendly with and is a nice guy and is charming and charismatic enough, just plays an extra land and you know. Is he a cheater? Is he? Did he just play an extra land? We've all made a mistake like that before, you know. Sorry, this is a little background noise for a moment. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, so you're so, yeah, go on. So so basically, you said a couple of things. You said that uh, you decided to do things opportunistically, which meant that you didn't wake up in the morning deciding I'm going to manipulate my deck today. But when there was an opening and you saw that. The repercussions were not going to be high. Like maybe you just get a take back or a slap on the wrist or not even a warning, as you said, you mm -hmm. would take that. So I understand what you're saying there, but I still want to go through your mental process of why even decide to cross the line? Like, was there, because I, I would, again, I can't generalize for you. This is why I wanted to have you on the podcast, right? right. Uh, cheaters generally have like different if I can stereotype, they generally have different ways that they, they rationalize it. One, it's like, I can get away with it. So why not? Uh, another potential way is, or reasoning is entitlement, right? They feel right. like there should, they should not be subject to variance because they've prepared, they deserve it. You know, the, the cliches, that kind of stuff, right? There might be other reasons as well, or there, it might be some sort of just habitual thing that okay they they get they get addicted to um the feeling of it that they got away with something like so for you i just want to be honest like what was it a was it a combination of these things was it one of these things like what's going through your mind when you in the early days when you decide to to cheat basically so uh in the in the time at the time i think the the reason at the time was definitely not not evident to me looking back on it now i'm able to look at it with a lot more clarity especially because while i don't like like we were thinking like what was the first time like what was the the initial the, the very first one that you did like not not unknowing or even remembering when or where that was or even necessarily like how early it started um at the time i weirdly enough almost didn't need a justification for it like it would almost be i i believe i believe what happened was i did it because i could get away with it like that that was the 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 reason that i ended up like you know going through with it but the, but why would i start doing it to in the first place um at the time i didn't really understand it one bit I, it took a lot of like reflecting on it over the years and kind of trying to like learn things about myself and you know just why i do or don't do the things that i that i always have done um to really figure out why i did that so for instance i would say to myself you know i don't like thieves i really don't like they're like kind of it, to me being a thief is like really like unforgivable almost you know so why would I, you know, cheat at a game that... Because you understand, I guess, looking back on it, that you were, it's a zero something, right? You were stealing, you were effectively right. stealing from somebody. You took something away from other people that they, it, it became a lack of fairness. You understand what I'm saying, right? Exactly. Like you basically are that person, objectively. Yeah. Right. So so where does so exactly right so then where does that justification come like you know part of me i certainly didn't look at it back then as stealing like not even in the same not even in the same category even though you know looking looking at it pretty black and white like okay well 
these people were entitled a fair shot at prize money and opportunities, et cetera. And you, you know, did illicit things that would literally jeopardize that. So like literally it's the same, it's the same, similarly or the same stealing. So why, you know, so looking back on it, I wondered why something that was so antithetical to like, you know, something that I couldn't stand, why would, did I do it? And part of me comes to the conclusion that it was, it, it didn't need, it did certainly didn't meet those criteria to me at the time. Like I was certainly was never, not once at any point doing any of these things saying like, I'm stealing from this, from John or Joe or whatever, you know what I mean? Like I'm, it was more of a, I, I believe looking back on, I believe it was more of like a self-preservation thing, more of a, if I don't continue to perform at whatever level it was, then it means that I'm not uh, worthy or good enough at this game that I've at this point spent so much time and devoted so much of my identity to. Like if somebody were to ask me, can you describe yourself in five words? I would say magic. Like, you know what I mean? Like that, that was it. It was pretty much my entire, entire life. And anybody who knows me, you know, knows that for sure. There was no, no separation of me, myself, my identity, who I was, my self-worth. Anyway, there was no separation of any of it from the game. Um, so for me, I believe that, like you said, the game has variance in it. You can't always win at it. Um, as soon as I was under that, the pressure to, to always perform, whether it was to get points, to top eight, to do whatever it was, as soon as that pressure mounted there, the choice became, if I don't perform, then I'm not good at this. And the risk of cheating is very, relatively low because the things that I'm doing, I can get away with. And in fairness, it was much easier at that time to get away with them because this was, I mean, uh, video footage footage of these events was like kind of starting at the time like it was like kind of a new thing but even then in 2009 2008 like the if you look at some of the footage on these you know these star city games events it's pretty grainy and it's not like it is today where it's like you know a thousand people in a twitch chat typing in me like oh did you see that that guy shuffle cheated like no it, it was nothing like that at all and you know that, that begged the question people were always wondering, you know, why did you cheat on camera? And it was one of the things that it was, it, it didn't cross my mind much because at the time there wasn't, the, there wasn't much of a difference between that match and a match off camera because they were, to me, they were all around the same stakes. Like I just had to win it. So if I found an opportunity and one on camera or off camera, I wasn't, thinking about like oh well now i'm on camera i can't i can't act this way or or now i'm off camera i can act this way it was more just like this is how i can and need to act because i need to perform did you uh cheat at all before you won your first scg uh event because you mentioned pretty early on you won an event right i think you said yeah. 2007 or 2008 yes that was what that was what got me started was winning an event relatively early in my uh professional career starting off so uh, i i don't remember any instances before that and so you were clean when you like up to that point in that yeah. early stage i, I, okay. I yes i would say that with pretty so i want to i want to ask you then because uh, you mentioned self-preservation you mentioned you know uh at all points during the SCG circuit, like a point was a point. So it was always important to keep up performance, but did you not ask yourself or did you not tell yourself like, Hey, I, I was doing it clean. So why, why, why cross the line? I guess, I, I guess I'm still trying to get into that. Cause like, right. I, like, for example, let, let's just use an analogy, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I run a half marathon and I, and I, I was able to do it without doping. So, uh, I, I know I can do a half marathon or I can complete this thing without, without crossing the line. So why still cross the line? If you obviously have the ability to, to do it, you, you know what I mean? Yes, uh, absolutely. Right. And that was one of the questions that a lot of people had as well, was that if he was, he was so skilled and, and good at the game, why did he need to resort because i think you had people actually say that you were skilled right. at the game like this is this is way later this is after the explorers but like people 
I, I, I read some comments. I don't want to say, I don't, I don't want to say, I don't want to name drop, but people will sure. say like Alice could have been a, probably a, a pro tour level player if he wanted to, if he was, you know, right. if he was clean. Right. So uh, yeah, I'm just wondering about that. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I, at the time it was certainly not something that I was, you know, something that there wasn't a crossroads that I came to where I was like, well, if I, if I continue along this path and eventually get caught, you know, then I've kind of just, you know, derailed all of the efforts that I've made uh, professionally up to this point. So for me, there wasn't a, at the time, there certainly wasn't a need for me to not do it because I was good enough. There was just a need to do better. If I could get more points by doing it, I would do it. So it was, yes, I think that I, I could have done it without it. And I had shown there was many, there were many tournaments that I won without, without cheating. Absolutely. But the thing was that I, it was always a pressure to, to win more. And I think it was definitely, you know, at the time I wasn't afraid there. I didn't feel, I don't think I felt fear at the time, but I think that that was probably the number one driving factor was just fear being afraid that I would fall off the, the train that I would not get enough points at one time. There would be a, a month or a year or whatever it was that a street that I wouldn't win or do well in. And that would, the whole house of cards would come down then. So the, rather than, rather than stress about it at the point where it was too late, continuing to do it, despite, you know, not necessarily needing to at times, like there were, there were times that I would cheat in a game that was lost already that I couldn't win anyway, but it was something that I could get, get away with. So why not, why not take that chance? You know, I, w I want to ask you a little bit more about the opportunistic part, because I think there's, Actually, I'll just ask, like, mm -hmm. when it comes to that aspect, does that mean that heading into every match, you're trying to figure out if you can pull a fast one over your opponent? Like, like because it's opportunistic, are you just always trying to push for an edge, regardless of what your record is, regardless of where you are? Like, because as you said, right, like mm -hmm. every point could matter. So are you going to every match or every game even thinking like, how can I, how can I get away with it? No, I I would I wouldn't say that. That I actually thought very little about the individual cheats before or after, and even most of the time during. Like it, it, honestly, it's kind of what makes what made them so difficult to catch and difficult to detect over the years. And I played and was under camera on camera a lot, and I played with a lot of people watching me a lot. So despite how bad people think I might be at it like that I got caught or did it on camera how silly or whatever the the fact was that the method that I used was so hard to detect and I got away with it for so long because I, I I believe the reason I got away with it so much was because I didn't go into every match thinking how am I going to cheat it was almost like I'm trying to think of an analogy like it would be kind of like walking into a grocery store with the with like if you walk in there looking behind your shoulder and like with a hoodie hoodie on and like kind of looking where the cameras are like eventually they'll the, the people who are in the know will know that that's a person that they should be watching because that's what sketchy people do but if you go into a grocery store with the intention of buying everything and not stealing anything and then you slip a banana into your pocket nobody will catch you ever because you didn't even go in there really thinking about it like you the it was almost like a like I don't want to say a second nature thing, but it was almost like a like no, I wouldn't go into okay, I'm playing against this person. This person looks dumb. I think I could cheat them. Like no, it wasn't like that. It was more just like a hmm. On this board, it would really help if I had an extra white mana because I need to be able to cast two swords to plowshares, and I only have one white mana. So if I tap my lands like this, I'll be able to play a swords and get a, and they won't notice blah 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 so the so i wouldn't necessarily go into a match like thinking okay well here's because you can't even i, I couldn't okay, even so you're, you're just thinking like i need to win this game 
and then you're trying to think about all the ways that I can, or that you can do it. Is that is that kind of how it is? Yes, but yeah, but it's weird because it, it sounds like that that means that like each game I'm kind of looking for like the way that I approach a game was it's just like a way that a normal person approaches it like how do I win this game? Yeah, so I I'm sorry if I'm being really direct, yeah, no here, but I, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out like what's your motto for deciding okay I'm gonna pull a fast one because as you said you're not you might not be doing this every match or every game like obviously right. you lose matches uh, playing any tournament and you're not it's not like Alex is nine and zero in every in every yeah. SCG, right? Um, so was it, is it like, how, what's your criteria? Is it, is it like, you don't think your opponent will notice? Uh, you think you're gonna win if you happen to pull a fast one? Like, I, I'm trying to figure out like, yeah, I think I, I know it's hard to explain it, but right. uh, just like how it's hard to not, not just in the sense that maybe you don't, you forgot about it, but just in the sense that it's hard to explain anything. Like, how do I, how do I, um, how do I ride a bicycle? Like at some point it becomes yeah. so second nature to you, but what, what, what's your criteria? That's what I'm asking. I think it was a lot more context dependent. So there was, there was a balancing between whether I thought this person would notice it, whether I thought it would be meaningful or necessary in a game. Um, and you know, there was, I, I think that, I think that I uh, I just had so much familiarity with the game and understanding of it. Like I played so much of it that I would almost naturally be able to figure out instances where finding a cheat would be useful. Slack like balancing all those things. Like again, the risk of getting caught, the consequences, the amount that it would affect the game is probably not a thing that a lot of people even like think of. Like like if you could put like a, a little meter on the side of the game, like the Cheeto meter, like what is the benefit of cheating here if they tried to cheat? Like, like that's not even a, a thought that goes through people's head because they're not looking, they're not like, they're not, they don't have any experience with cheating. <laughs> so I guess that it might've even just been a subconscious thought that at any time I could be capable of doing it. If something, if it met the criteria for doing so, that I think that makes it sound like I did it more than I did, but um, there was certainly not a, there certainly wasn't a time or a point where it was like off limits. Like for instance, if there was, a, if the opportunity presented itself, there would just, you know, if an opportunity presented itself in the game, I would immediately do that calculus that, okay, is it worth it? Will I get away with it? Will it change the effect of the game? kind of get like all that all the those things were just it was kind of just like playing a land on your first turn like kind of like a second like nature thing like so i think it was more of a context thing rather than a um than something i could really explain like how i how i got there i don't know how i got there honestly i, I don't know how i got to the point where i was able to kind of weigh how when and if i should cheat um, it certainly wasn't something that I was thinking of every single game on every single instance, but it was something that I would say if I had to pick a number, I probably would think about cheating maybe one out of every 10 games, let's say. And if I wanted to, it, I got away with it in nine and a half out of all 10 of those games. So, mm -hmm. like you know the, Let, the number let's, let's put a let's put a number hmm. let's put a number on it i mean you you were suspended in 2011 after um the two explorers incident mm -hmm. uh you had been playing scg for three four years before then like so can you put a number on how many times you cheated during that time span no i couldn't pick an exact number but if i had to guess uh let's see from let, let's say 2008 or 9 to 2011 um was that three years so i probably played in 50 events maybe i would probably say i cheated maybe 50 or 60 times, probably, I would say 
maybe like once an event, maybe like either once, like it was not like on as like an average, like there might be an event where I cheated three times and then an event where I cheated zero. But like, so I would say something like that would probably be like, it certainly wasn't a lot more than that. And it certainly wasn't a lot less than that. Like it wasn't five times and it wasn't 300 times. So it's, I think that that number is probably fine. It was probably less than, I'm trying to think three years, like how many events, because that would be, you know, it would just be events that I felt were important and mattered. So at, for instance, I wouldn't cheat in a casual game and stuff like that, which always kind of defeated the argument that some people had that thought that I was like kind of impulsive on it. Like that it was just so ingrained in, like who I was as a person that I would like, you know, not literally not be able to stop myself from doing it, which is what some people thought was the reason that I did it on camera was like, well, he did it on camera and he's not stupid. So the only reason he must've done it on camera is because he literally could not physically stop himself. And so, you're saying that's not true. You're saying that you, you did make conscious decisions when and when not to do it. Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent made conscious decisions. But, but you understand that it doesn't completely line up what you said, where, you know, you, you mentioned that when you do decide to do it, that it, it can be almost a subconscious thing. Like you didn't like, it's not premeditated. So I'm trying to understand right. like how well, to reconcile those statements. The, the act of doing it at, it, it was different than the reasoning. Right. So in other words, the, while, while I'm doing it, I'm not actively thinking about, you know, how to necessarily do it, which is where the premeditation comes in. The premeditation comes in saying, I'm going to mark these sleeves because I need to draw the Tron lands on turn three, or I need to know where in a foil basic land in my deck is coming up. So that's the premeditation because you're thinking of the situation and how you're going to do it. Whereas for me, I was in a situation and did it. They're both cheating. They're both like the same thing. It's just one is a matter of one is a matter of context. Like someone who knows how to shuffle cheat knows that they need to practice shuffle cheating ahead of time, and they have to know how to cut someone's deck and whatever the details of that are. Mm -hmm. Whereas for me, it would be more of a matter of how do I need to talk to this judge in case something happens. Like if a judge interviews me and asks me. Uh, your opponent said you played uh, an additional land this turn. Can you tell us about that? You know, like talking to the talking to the judge or figuring out the exact situation came up as it came up, rather than something that I was preparing for ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So, the I would say that it wasn't a compulsion to always cheat. It was a conscious decision, like should I cheat? Do I need to cheat here? And, you know, the answer was yes or no. So for a casual game of magic, the answer would be no, because I didn't have the fear of failure, whatever it was to go with it since it was a casual mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. But once the SCG points were on the line or whatever grand prix top eight was on the line, which again, starts around one. It doesn't just start in round 14 or whatever. It's all, it's always on during the competitive events. Th then, then the, you know, the cat, the, the checkbox is already on. Like, yes, I can cheat if I need to for these. Does that mean that you were cheating regardless of whether you were um, winning your rounds in a tournament or whether you're losing the rounds in a tournament? Like, yeah. I guess, so yeah. it was different or it was the same? No, it was the same. It was the same whether I was winning or losing. Correct. Okay. And during this time, like your first 40, 50 tournaments, did anybody confront you? For example, a friend that's watching your games, a judge that's watching the games. Like, did you have any conversations? Did people have conversations with you about, um, did some people notice what you were doing and confront you about it? Uh, no. Not, not really. No, um, again, not to, not to my knowledge, and certainly I, I would hope not to anybody else's knowledge. Because if other people were, if there was a pattern being developed and there was an understanding of it, then they, then they really did a bad job of capitalizing on it or figuring it out. Um, I guess certainly nobody came up to me with any suspicions about it. Any individual instance that was brought up to a judge, I'm sure was, you know, I, I can't 
speak for how the judges, what the judges were thinking or not thinking, but it certainly wasn't proposed to me like, oh, you must be cheating all the time. The first instance that I heard about it, that I was on their radar was slightly before the, the 2011 ban, I think maybe a couple of months, like I got banned in, in December of 2011. So I believe maybe October of that year was the first things I'd heard of. And the, and the tournament that I ended up winning in December, that one, I know that I was being watched a lot by the judges and they had undercover judges and all this stuff. So at some point around then was when there was whispers of it, but certainly for the first, so 2008, 2009, 2010, no, nothing of the sort. And if there, and when there was, um, infractions, you know, like if I, if there was a, a, an infraction that I did, it was certainly not treated as though it was malicious cheating. So, um, you mentioned towards the end of 2011, you were being watched or you're on some, some sort of watch list, um, mm -hmm. by the judges, did the judges or SCG ever come and talk to you about any of it? No. Okay. So it was, you just had individual conversations about things that happened in a particular game. But there was no um, communication between the judges or the organizer and you about any of it. Prior to the, the band, the prior to the first band, no. Okay, and did you have any associates or friends that were cheating also at that time? Like, were there were you the only were you the only person that was doing it at the SCG circuit or otherwise? No, there was many, many players that were doing it um, on the higher level and on the lower level that were also cheating. Um, you know, it was it's tough because I don't know, like, for instance, it, it, it's people always say, oh, well, what what instances do you know of them cheating? Like, that's that's one of the funny parts about it, is that like, if you could prove it, you know, certainly, let's say, let's say me and someone else are playing and I suspect that they've cheated. It's not it's not something you can do anything about. Like if they're, if they've cheated and you have proof, congratulations, you now that the, the world knows that they are cheated and they have, you have proof that they cheated. But if you don't have any proof that they, let's say they're playing against you, you don't have any proof that they've cheated. They haven't cheated, right? Like that for, for everybody else's perception, they haven't cheated. So luckily for me, you guys can see on camera a couple of instances mm -hmm. and ta-da, it's, it's a, it's a magic little gift wrap box for you. But for the 99 other cheats that all the other players are doing that you don't see on camera, those are just going to be one of those like, well, yeah, person A and person B cheat and they cheat all the time at the tournaments and you read their articles and you love them and you worship them and you respect them and you follow them on Twitter, but they're cheating your ass off in a tournament, but you don't know it because they don't have a little gift wrap box for you of camera footage mm -hmm. or some of them even do. And it's not really perceived that way. So there are many, many players and not just SCG players, many professionals to this day, 2023 that are cheating their ass off in any tournament and doing it in similar ways that I did where they cheat when they can. And, you know, there's even instances of shuffle cheating and marking sleeves and all that stuff all the time at these events. Um, so, and at that time I was aware that, several players were cheating, especially at the higher, like, you know, in higher up in the club were cheating. And I guess. When you say aware, is that because you witnessed it or because you heard through word of mouth? Sometimes I would witness it. Sometimes I'd hear it through word of mouth, both. Like there was a time where I saw a player, a, a higher up in the uh, SCG club, just they were sitting next to me playing a match right next to me. And, you know, I'm shuffling up for game two and I'm looking over at their game and the player plays squadron hawk. And they go grab three cards from their deck, Squadron Hawk, Squadron Hawk, and like another white card slipped under the other Squadron Hawk. I'm like, okay, grab my Squadron Hawks. And like the person like fans them out. And it's just a Gideon Jura. Two Squadron Hawks and a Gideon Jura. You know what I mean? Like like that. Like this not wasn't like a oops, you know what I mean? Like, especially because like this player, you know, was, and you know, I saw another one, you know, person just fetches, plays Dryad Arbor, taps in immediately. Natural orders it for a progenitus, just right there. Like, again, these are things that you call a judge over, 
Judge comes over. Oops, you you tapped a summoning sick dryad arbor. Don't do that again. Or in some of these mm. instances, the dry the progenitus is in play. <laughs> You know, in the instance of the Squadron Hawk, the player at least fanned it out, and the the the, the Gideon Juror was thrown back in the deck. Mm-hmm. But you know, so it's. But again, that's one of those things where it's like you know, not every cheat's going to be successful. But like, that player was not. Oops, it got stuck. I gra- I meant to grab the Squadron Hawk that was next to that Gideon Juror in my deck. It was, the player was trying to grab a Gideon Juror with their Squadron Hawk. So, you know, nobody ever hears about these things, but these. These things happen all the time in the in the games at the professional level, and I mean it, it's an it's a thing where there's a hundred, two hundred, five hundred matches going on, and there are five judges or two judges or eight judges. It doesn't, you know what I mean? Like it's just a matter of like the the only referee. Imagine imagine playing a sport, you know, like tennis, and there's no referee because that's what magic is. Magic does not have a referee. It's your opponent. Your opponent's like, I guess that was out of bounds. You know what I mean? Like, right. It, then they call a judge to verify that it was out right. of bounds or not. Correct. Yeah. In in the battle of like security camera versus thief, thief always wins. One thief might mm-hmm. not win, but ninety nine thieves will win against security camera. So the same thing in magic is that, and, and people that are intending to cheat know that, and um, they know that it's a a, a battle that they're favored in. Especially, especially at that time in 2011, like you know, the the DCI and Star City Games definitely set an example with me. But before that, you could do whatever you wanted because, you know, if you you know, I wasn't like some pioneer in cheating and like figuring out this brand new technology and how to like talk to judges and cheat. no, this is a thing that was going on long before I picked up my first basic land. Uh, you know, players were were cheating in Magic like crazy. And it's because, you know, it's because it's it's easily facilitated. You can you can do an illegal play. Either A, you won't get caught, or B, if you do get caught, you have the benefit of the doubt. You know, you're guilty until proven innocent. You're able to wiggle and worm your way out of it. I mean, like I said, the, the biggest, the ones that got, the people that got cheated, the, the people that cheated and got the hammer thrown at them the hardest and the most, the mo- without any subtlety were the ones that just like did shuffle cheats and marked their decks and did stuff that was like blatantly you can't explain this you can't explain why all your urza's factories have a fingernail mark on them like that doesn't you can't just say oops but you can say oops for playing an extra land tapping an extra white drawing an extra card blah, 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 you know what uh, taking one less damage forgetting to take damage off a fetch like, that is all sure. oops. so and to say that you know and a lot, a lot of people naively think that you know that their favorite players or some certain players do or don't do it. And the answer is, unfortunately, none of you people have any idea. Even I don't know. You know what I mean? For every one person that I know that cheats, there are probably two that do that I have no clue. And there were many mm-hmm. times in the SSG circuit, you know, looking back that I was cheated at, cheated against many times. Not me sitting there completely uh, clueless to it. So the, the unfortunate fact is that it happens. It happens a lot and it happens all the time and it still happens today and it happens whether you know maybe it's not happening on camera for 1000 twitch viewers to look at but there are 99 other tables and magic's a hard complicated game and officiating and judging magic is a hard and complicated task this isn't me you know jabbing at the judges and the tournament staff this is just you know it's just an unfortunate situation that that we live in with paper magic and that is that that isn't going to change and it's funny because today actually was the announcement that the uh, judge program you know was uh the wizards is stopping their partnership with the judge program on um, literally today it was announced so it's funny i don't know mm-hmm. i don't know what it means for the the future of paper magic it's not one that i'm part of anyway but um you know back when i was initially when, when i was still playing you know towards the end before my final ban i had offered to talk with judges about how to catch cheaters and you know there was there there were several players you know i was in california at the time there were several judges that took an interest in me you know doing a a seminar where i would and i did a couple of these seminars actually where i went to an event or i went to a judge conference what year was this this is after the ban or or suspension this is before right before the final ban so the year i got banned was 2017 20 
I think it was 2017, right. but it was my final event. So it was 20. So you actually had these seminars where you helped uh, educate the judges on what to look out for. Yes. Yes. I had, I did three of them. Um, and yeah, I have, I, I, I don't think I have it anymore. The, the document that I typed up was many pages where I would go into detail and the best way to catch cheaters and all this stuff. And some of the, the, the most receptive people to it were the judges. The judges were actually pretty receptive and there were a lot of judges that I knew very much did not like me, but were still appreciative of the material that I didn't, that was, you know, free of charge. I didn't give me any judge from was for doing it. You know, I just, I wanted to, you know, the, 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 I wanted to show that I, you know, had something to offer the judge program and something to offer the game that wasn't just, you know, R r rampant cheating that I could. I, I have to. I have to ask. Did mm -hmm. you out any of the players? The the players that you knew were cheaters at that time when you were playing. For example, the person that got the Gideon with the Squadron Hawks. Mm -hmm. Like, did you? If you know beyond a shadow of the doubt that they were cheating, did you out them? I, I certainly discussed it with players. Like, I mean, um, I, there were multiple times I brought things to the attention of the judge, but the problem is that. Uh, it's similarly with ironically enough with myself is that even if you say something about someone to the judges or the staff you can only like kind of make bring something to their attention you can't necessarily um do anything fruitful in the end i guess just bringing attention so yes the answer is yes i did bring certain uh situations to judges attention and i'm sure players did that about me as well um and that that's probably what culminated in the first ban in general i there was no uh disqualification like up until my first ban i had never been disqualified from an event i had never been given a match loss for cheating so to immediate to just be banned in december of 2011 the first ban it must have been the culmination of multiple instances of outing and uh whistleblowing whatever the equivalent is you know um so those there was a little bit it was a little bit less public back then. So, for instance, nowadays you just go on Twitter and post the link to the the Twitch clip where you found the person cheating. In two thousand and eight and two thousand and nine, that was not a thing. There wasn't a. You, it just wasn't a thing. Like Twitter existed, but it wasn't the the platform for hysteria that it is nowadays. So, um, technically, it's you know the the. The name and shame method is a little bit more effective at catching cheaters, a little bit, because at least in the instance of where you're outing somebody, like for instance the uh, Squadron Hawk Gideon Jura thing, at least an instance like that, it will it will cause enough of a of a, a wave, a ripple that the right ears will hear it, the right eyeballs will see it, even if there's not camera footage, at least people will be aware of it. So that kind of uh, whistleblowing didn't exist really back then. It wasn't. It was just starting out kind of thing. So Okay, so um, one thing you did mention is that cheating has been going on in Magic for a long time. And I'm thinking about the 90s in the Pro Tours and where people just named and shamed um, players, right? That they thought were dirty. Like, for example, uh, there has been there was a lot of landmark work done by players during that time to basically call out folks that they thought were, were not clean. Are you able to state on the record the players that you think are not playing clean that are still actively playing today? Yeah, I um Yeah, I'm not sure if I should. <laughs> I don't know if there's any I remember being advised a while back to be cautious of specific examples that I talked about with the cheating and specifically for legal reasons. Um when asked so you think that these players might take legal action against you is that why you don't want to do it or not something not necessarily um not necessarily i do i think like there's you know do i think there's a less than one percent chance yes but is it like you know i think i don't i don't think it's of uh in my best interest to to name drop and point names because then it becomes a a similar question to what ended up getting me what what ended up the, what ended up being the reception towards my um towards the thing I was doing with the judges 
the reception I got from the judges was incredibly positive when I literally specifically went into the details of not only how I cheated, but how other people were cheating without everything but the name dropping, like talking about all these instances. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I gave specific examples, like not just like mm -hmm. imaginative things. I gave specific examples of things that I watched and witnessed firsthand, right. not through word of mouth, firsthand visually. And... But let me let me let me just like put it, lay out my logic. You may mm -hmm. not agree with my logic, and that's that's totally fair. Okay. Uh, we just said that cheating is stealing. You basically said that cheating, or you 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 agree with me that cheating is taking something away from other players that are that are not playing that are playing clean, right? Is that yeah. Is that is that fair to say? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and you did say that you see, you saw uh, during your days, right? Playing, mm -hmm. you you sat next to somebody that was without a shadow of the doubt cheating. Like yeah. like there was no accident to getting a Gideon with the Squadron Hawks. Like right. you knew without a shadow of the doubt that person hundred percent that the person was cheating in that moment. So if there are players today that are still playing that are actively stealing from other players, do you not feel some sort of obligation to maybe not on this podcast, but even to tell the judges, literally, this person is doing it. You should investigate them. Like two wrongs don't make a right. right. Two wrongs is two wrongs, right? So I, I could be yeah. I could be a cheater, but mm -hmm. that doesn't take away from the fact that factually this other person is a cheater. So I'm trying to understand like it did. It did though. That it did process, right? It did. It did take away from the fact. That is. That is the difference here. It very much did take away from the fact. My name, my reputation, my agendas, whatever you want to call them, did very much take away from my credibility on what I have to say, entirely. And that okay. was evident with me when I did the but, judge but thing. But now, that... but but I guess my my logic is that if you're able to talk about who these players are now. You have nothing to lose now. Your credibility is is different than what it was when you were being investigated or you were trying to. I disagree. I think my my credibility couldn't be less than zero if I wanted it to be. Like it, it is beyond any shadow of a doubt zero. Zero. It is negative one. My credibility. I could say okay. I, I, that 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 is something I have beyond any uh, doubt about, uh, and I've seen throughout okay. the years and. It, it started with when I was talking with the judges and trying to do that and giving specific examples. The magic community's response was, I would almost think the magic community did not want me to out anybody or did not want the help that I had to offer because mm. for whatever reason, the judges were receptive to it. But I certainly learned from that. And since then, even I've learned that my credibility is beyond zero. So I don't have a problem with it. But if I gave you five names right here on the record, it would not it would not mean what you think or what you would hope it would mean certainly not what i hope it would mean so and you're saying you never gave these names to the dci or to the judges uh i i mentioned yeah i mentioned by name multiple times to judge staff specific players and specific instances over the years yes i did do you know if they were being investigated and i guess they they're still some of them are still actively playing today that's what you're saying yes some of them are still actively playing today, but okay. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know if they're still under current investigation. I I, I don't know the inner workings of uh, how the investigations are done, but I will say it is a losing battle from the judge point of view. So I don't I don't envy their job of figuring out and doling judgment. You know whether they see it or whether it's based on some band players word of mouth or what he says he saw or says he didn't see. But I do know that the things that I say, you know, if I say that it, 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 it said, it, it said it's tainted. Every word that I say regarding magic is tainted. Like, you know, I could tell you that blue is the best color for counter spells. And it would be like, Oh, that's what a cheater would say. Like it, it's, 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 it's actually kind of preposterous. Like it's, at first, I took it very kind of like almost personally that, you know, well, just because I cheated doesn't mean that the things I have to say aren't valid. You know, it, I don't think that the responses that people had were appropriate based on, you know, it was kind of over overblowing certain things. 
and then it got to the point where I realized that, you know, whether it's the nature of so the social media machine or whether it's just human nature or whatever it is, it's just past the point of reason and uh there isn't a reasoning with the mob so it's it's like it, at this point it doesn't matter what i do or what i say i could have a cure for cancer in my hand right now it wouldn't even make it to the doctor's office like it wouldn't even be examined so and i've i've learned to accept that and be okay with that because a lot of the the space that i once pined to be part of and you know was centered to my identity you know, I've I've seen under the ugly veil of it. And yeah, I mean, it could be coming from a jilted and jaded band magic player that people think I am. That That's fine and dandy. But I have seen the underbelly of the game and I've seen the underbelly of your favorite magic players. <laughs> I played with them. I lived with them. I worked with them. I've seen it. I've seen many instances of things that don't get reported, things that are just brushed off as honest accidents given the benefit of the doubt and if i were to say you know john smith is a savage cheater and i saw him cheat here here and here at event in this year this year and this year and this card this card and this card in round four five and six i could say that all right now on the record in writing and give a very detailed i could write which basic island was in play which set it was from i could write all that and it wouldn't it wouldn't even be, it, first of all, if it wasn't on camera, you can't even do anything about it. You can't, like, who's to say that I'm not just talking out of my ass? And um, it, it's the, the words of a heretic. But, but, but you understand that um, for the same reasons you said, like, now we're in an uh, internet age. Now we're in an age where people are doing detective work pro bono, right? People yeah. are going through... Uh, honestly, because they have a lot of time on their hands, they're just kind of bored at work mm -hmm. or whatever. But you could mention a name now. And let's say that you mentioned someone who you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, <clears throat> cheated. Someone could go through all of their footage, right? Like the community would be able to do that. And then they would make a decision or, or maybe the judges or the community or some combination that could still be a net positive that could still potentially help take a cheater out of the picture even mm. though it wasn't completely your word like you could just right. suggest that joe blow did that mm. and someone might be able to go through and say hey look this person did that here this and we never looked for it before but this actually happened at this pro tour and this scg event and this whatever like would that not still be a net positive like you could still mention someone's name and the community could then verify it it's not actually your word versus like it's not up to you alone do you understand what i'm saying right. like if i said if i said lance armstrong cheated because he used drugs it's not completely up to me like i could be a cheater i could be a savage cheater but the community could then look through all the tour de france and and figure out like and do their own private investigation because that's also the same logic that they suspended and banned you because it's it was not all firsthand information. It was like corroborating right. evidence from different accounts, right? I that guess, someone yeah. could independently do investigation. So I'm I'm still trying to um I'm sorry to harp on this so much, but I'm still trying to figure out like would there not be a benefit to publicly stating like this person might be shady and and just tell your truth and let other people fill in the gaps. Yeah, I guess I guess part of me over the years had tried doing that and was immediately quashed um, when I tried to do that with the judge program. So I guess I wouldn't be opposed to doing it again. Again, like at this point, I don't have anything to lose. I don't have anything to gain. So it would be pretty, you know, aside from any kind of I would need to speak to somebody who would talk with me on a legal basis if there's any kind of legal ramifications because that's the first thing I need to make sure that I'm 100% clear of, because that I, I, I certainly will not have even the slightest risk of any kind of legal action taken against me for the sake of the magic community, who can all, you know, continue on as they, as they are, uh, for all I care. Um, I love the game. I would prefer the game to have more integrity in it. I, I tried to bring to light a lot of <laughs> 10 years of firsthand experience cheating and getting away with it to the judges and to the community, 
in a very helpful format that again the judge judge speak again the judges were very receptive to it <laughs> it was pretty you know with, without tooting my own horn it was pretty good source material um let's just say and the magic community's response was so i i, I don't care if i'm the minority it's just ridiculous it is the the greater magic community the the twitter the reddit whatever community this is is it's such a deformed blob of bad perspective of bad outlook of short-sighted thinking and you know what i honestly think that i could and maybe i i could be uh you know if, if there's a positive reaction afterwards and everybody on twitter wants me to out five or ten names i'll do it i'll write them down i'll give a list of where and when I observe certain things, and if the community is generally wanting me to do that, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. But um, I want it to be stated that it isn't some deep, dark secret that I've kept hidden inside, and it's rather something that the magic community does not, it doesn't care about. They want to be fed the things that they know and the things that they like and the things that they agree with. They want they they only want to hear what they want to hear and they want confirmation on what they know to be true. So, for instance, I'm gonna say Reed Duke. He's never cheated. The guy has no doesn't have a bad bone in his body. But let's just say tomorrow I said Reed Duke is a cheater and he cheated here, 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 and here. And here's some examples. There aren't any on camera, but this is just my word that I saw these things. The response wouldn't be one of sleuthiness, of investigativeness. It wouldn't be one of, well, let's get to the bottom of this. It would be a, a mockery. It would be a jeering. It would be a laugh fest. It would just be, ha ha, yes, I'm sure he did. Yeah, I'll, of course, yeah, some cheater would say that to take something off of him. Or he's just wanting to spit one out into the aether because he doesn't like Reed for whatever reason or whatever, you know, and like I said, this Reed is not a cheater by any stretch. I'm just saying a name that would cause commotion because it would just be like, that goes completely against every single thing that I've ever thought and believed. And that makes me uncomfortable. So the answer is no, I don't believe you. I don't care. I don't, it's not, it's not, it, it, it's just, um, that's just the, the way that social media works. And that's the way that information is spread these days and um i i ideally it would be a fruitful endeavor i if, if trust me i would sleep slightly better if i could say 10 names of people that i've seen cheat over the years and 10 people were investigated for cheating trust me i, I wish that's how it went i'd have them the the names written in calligraphy but you know what it's it's not it's just not how the world works and it's just not how the internet works and it's you know the however much people think that people are interested in a redemption story or people are interested in the truth or people are interested in justice people are just interested in their own self-interest and hearing what they already believe in you know having a pat on the back and feeling smart that's what people are interested in so that that would be my response if everybody responds to this and they want me to come out and name a bunch of names maybe i will it, you know, and I I would certainly hope that other professionals in the scene would also do the same because if you think I'm the only person that knows ten cheaters that have never been caught or never, ten cheaters that have that are cheating to this day, you're I'm probably in the I'm probably in the least know of some of these other cheaters. There are many people that still play test and still you know currently play with and against players that are currently cheating in the game to this day that are not banned and you know completely out of harm's way from the game. I can't do any more harm to the game. I can never play a sanctioned match of magic. I can never take a dollar from another human being in a game of magic. But there are still people today who are taking thousands from their fellow friends, and people are none the wiser. And there are plenty of them that I have never even heard of, and I don't know either. So I know that other people do know certain players who are cheating and not saying anything either. And part of me wonders, are they just that selfish and self-centered that they don't out those people either? Or are they also understanding that there's a similar to what I understand, which is that speaking a bunch of names into, into the, you know, into the air like that doesn't necessarily bring justice. It doesn't necessarily bring an investigation. It doesn't bring 
the result that you want. It just kind of exposes yourself, you know. Let's say that person A is on the Pro Tour and they have a good Twitter following, they have a sponsorship, they're making YouTube content, they're playing at the Pro Tour, they have a bunch of, everything's going great for them. But they know that their friend on their testing team is a cheater, okay? They know that player B that they test with, that they room with, that they go to these- They're saying that they're team. complicit in it and they don't want to say anything for that reason. Correct. They have a lot to lose by saying something about it. Now, when they play them in an event, they'll cut their deck. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, they'll give the, the the old eagle eyes on the on the gameplay, and everything's kosher, I'm sure. But are they going to, you know, risk speaking out? Think about the last time you heard about somebody doing that. Think about the last time you heard a big name pro player talking about one of their friends or one of the people on their testing team before the player got caught. Not afterwards, not not after the player got caught on camera cheating, but beforehand. And there aren't very many examples of it. And I understand why. I mean, it's a self-preservation thing. But the the long the, the the long and sad unfortunate truth is that many of the pro players who are playing the game today at a professional level are currently cheating. Doesn't make what I did better. Doesn't make what I did worse. I am completely devoid from the game. I not playing a sanctioned match ever again. People who are, are currently cheating at the game for thousands of dollars, taking from you and your friends. You're not in the game anymore, but how does it make you feel that some of those folks are competing today still and you are not? Um, it doesn't bother me on a, like, it doesn't bother me on a personal level. Like, it doesn't feel like, you know, unfair to me like it's just you know the the world is unfair i think that that's kind of one of the biggest realizations that people can and should have at some point in life is that the world is unfair very so as far as like personally it's just like it's not a, a big deal to me it's unfortunate because like obviously um or maybe not obviously but i would like to see fair and uh kosher magic play like if i could push a button and remove cheating from the gaming world entirely, I would, you know. <laughs> I said obviously, but maybe not obviously, right? <laughs> but I, I I definitely am a supporter of, like, fair play, and obviously I wouldn't want anybody cheating against me when we're playing any game. So, yeah, I, it obviously it's not ideal. I don't like it. I wish that it wasn't a thing. I wish that it was just, oh, you caught the big bad wolf, and now cheating doesn't exist in the game anymore. I wish that was the case, but... um. I guess I don't really think I don't really think about it much anymore because I don't think there's a solution to it. If I if I, if I thought there was a solution to it, I would have, I would try. Like I tried years ago to try and you know like I think people maybe thought like I was trying to tell the judges how to cash these cheaters because I wanted to like gain favor with them and stuff like that. Like I don't know I I don't know what kind of uh, agenda people thought that I had when I was like going into details on how to catch cheaters like. It, it it was kind of one of those like I, I don't there was no benefit to the magician revealing their secrets right like is it to to kind of like dissuade them to think that I've like changed my ways and like now that now since he's coming clean we never have to watch him ever again as if I got deck checked every they stopped calling it random deck check when they deck checked me in every tournament because they, they didn't want to insult me by calling it random they're like deck check Alex you know what I mean? like it, it wasn't even a random deck check. so I was like I don't know I, I think. It's easy for the the large number of Twitter and Reddit people who don't really go out and play in professional level events to to have opinions on something that they don't know very much about because they haven't sat there and played sixty hours of Magic a week and gotten on a flight to go to a, a Star City Games tournament or a Grand Prix. If you haven't done that before, or you haven't, you know, if your exposure to Magic is your local F and M where you know every single player and their parents and their where they live, like if that's your exposure to the game, it's it's like you know, you, there's a whole big ocean out there, and a lot, uh, you know, most people don't know it because most people don't live it. I know because I went to these events every week and I know how many people I saw. There was probably eight people that travel eight to ten people that travel to all these events and played as much as me and some of the other players do and unless you're living that lifestyle you don't you don't understand a lot of the things that go on in them and 
one of the things is the, is the, the aspect of cheating and that it happens more often than you think. Most of it is opportunistic cheating. I, I don't think that a lot of the players that are currently cheating in the game are shuffle cheaters. I don't think a lot of them are marking their sleeves or marking their cards. Um, there are probably some, but that's not... I wouldn't know. If I knew somebody who was doing that with, like, like if I knew somebody who was a shuffle cheater or a um, marking cards cheater that was playing right now, I would say, I would, have, I would have already said that, and that would already be on the internet. That would already be known, because those are easy to catch. The ones that are hard to catch are the ones that are not on camera. So you sitting at home have not seen the game, have not seen the play, have not seen the situation. And you will never see the game, the play, or the situation. You'll never see it. It'll never be before your eyes. You'll never be able to verify it. You will never be able to get proof, ever, for as long as you live. So that's a hard thing for people to understand, is that, like, your your favorite pro player, I know John Smith, he's a cheater. No, I don't have any camera evidence. No, I don't have any game to show you. I have zero. And I never will have any games to show you of them cheating. But I promise you he's so, a cheater. So that's why you're saying there's no solution because for those reasons, right? They're in the dark. Yes, correct. And it's 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 all it's all a mixture of these things. It's a mixture of their either not being camera footage, the players having a good reputation or not being scrutinized enough, the players not wanting to come clean about people they know are cheating. The the stigma the, the negative way that information is spread and the stigma on social media. Like all these little things all are just too big of a like you know what i mean like it's too much going against sticking the person in the jail cell do you know what i mean like for me it was easy because there was many instances multiple on camera multiple first-hand reports and i made myself very unlikable with how i approached the first ban so it was very easy to throw the book at me so all these things combined made it an extremely easily digestible thing to throw the book at me I'll throw away the key afterwards. Um, and So you felt like you were made an example of? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, not saying that what I did, what I got, what I got wasn't deserved or warranted. I'm not saying that, but I was certainly made an example of, and I don't think the example worked. <laughs> so um, that's, that's what I'll say. I'll say that. Let, let me, let me go into this. Like, uh, let's go, let's go back to your journey. Why didn't the example work even for yourself? Like you were suspended for 18 months mm -hmm. and then three years later you had a second suspension. What happened, Alex? Well, <laughs> you know, the, the second banning was for multiple infractions. There wasn't a specific game or instant accumulated infractions yes sure. accumulated accumulated okay. infractions right but were so, those infractions also opportunistic cheats um no they weren't but again that's that 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 so, is... so you're saying you're saying on the record here that after 2011 or coming back from 18 months suspension the first time you for the next three years you did not cheat correct yes i had cheated Plenty uh, until the first ban in 2011, maybe 50, 60, 70 times, somewhere in that range, plenty. And then I had three years off of the game where I played a little bit online, but kind of did just did other things and did other things in my life. And then I came back to the game in 2014, I believe it was 2014. I think they, they, I think they, ex yeah, I think it was 2014. 2014 or 15 i came back from the ban and no i did not cheat after that no so you're saying that after 2011 you did not intentionally cheat correct but four of those years or three of those years i was banned so like yes but like for the so when i came back from 2014 to the second ban i did no i did not intentionally cheat so what happened? Because you got the lifetime ban, as I understand, for using outside information and for having marked cards. Marked cards, which I, basically is your your quintessential textbook example of mm -hmm. a premeditated cheat. So what happened, in your words? Uh, I remember the event that I uh, that I got the uh, game loss for uh, marked cards, where it was the uh, Innistrad double double faced cards. And the judge claimed that they could see the double-faced cards through the sleeves. 
And uh, this was a judge that had a very personal issue with me that um, was reprimanded for following me around events and trying to get me uh, warnings and infractions. Um, they were told that they were no longer allowed to spectate me and watch any of my games after 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 this marked cards and outside information uh, game loss that they gave me. Um, and no, that wasn't what I was banned for the final time. Uh, in fact, I don't actually know what I was banned for the final time because the uh, correspondence that I got from Wizards didn't say. So the first. So time... they were not transparent. They did not actually tell you a reason. No, this time they did not. The previous ban they did. This ban they did not. What was, what was the reason? The the previous ban in 2014 was uh, you said multiple infractions. So yes. Just for the record, like what yeah. did they tell you? Uh, for... You know, I, I do still have the email. I will. I can I can pull that up uh, at some point. I, I have to look for it. I made sure to save all the emails. Um, I'm trying to remember what the exact words were because I have to go back. Um. It was re repeated infractions. So, for instance, I, I, I still never had, had no disqualifications. No, you know, any disqualification that I got would have immediately just obviously been a ban. So I think people think that there was a bunch of, like, smoking guns afterwards because that's just what people thought. Like, the fact is that after those bans, there was no video evidence of me cheating. There was no disqualifications so um <clears throat> if <laughs> that, that that's one of the things it's like one of the like people just assumed that i got banned this again for cheating but i the, of, of course I, I of course like wouldn't you think other wouldn't you think that you know if if i got if i got kicked out of your store for shoplifting and then you know you, you kick me out of your store for six months i come back in your store and then you notice things are missing again in your store, you're going to be like, well, he, he, you shoplifted again, didn't you? Like, the answer is, like, most likely yes, right? Like, the, the most obvious result is probably what happened. So any in-game infractions or mistakes or whatever were just automatically going to be cheats. Um, and that's how all my games were seen after the original ban was any infractions, any kind of mistakes that I made, innocent or not, were... Right, but as a as a tournament player myself, mm -hmm. I know that when you have an infraction or you there's a ruling of any kind, whether infraction or otherwise, there is the ability to appeal. So mm -hmm. what exactly... Can you give some specific examples of infractions that that you had and how you dealt with it like did you appeal them did you mm -hmm. was there some sort of process for that yes i i did uh, i did appeal um most of most of the infractions that i did i i appealed them especially ones where i felt um i got an unfair treatment on the actual ruling so can you give me an example of an infraction okay, um, during that yes time? let's see so for instance there was a um, uh, an affinity deck that i played uh in modern and it had a bunch of foils that I had since I was a kid. Since I started around the Mirrodin set, like I had like some random foils in the deck that I've had for literally since I started playing. And I had played this affinity deck at many, many events. And some of the cards were foil. Some of them were not. Okay. And I played this event, multiple events, all, you know, Grand Prix, And I played it in uh, Star City Games events. And then there was a one Star City Games invitational that i showed up to and i got my random deck check and you know they they checked the deck or whatever and they pulled me aside and they said okay alex um we think that some of these cards are marked and i was like oh okay what what's marked is like mean like i can cut to them or something they're like yeah we're worried that we can cut to some of the cards I'm like okay what which cards and they they, they pulled me aside they showed me they're like okay well this Arkbound Ravager is foil, and this Arkbound Ravager is not foil. I was like, okay, so then how do I know there's an Arkbound Ravager on top of my deck? I was like, well, we can, we can, uh, it, this one is foil, it, it like looks like it's warped a little bit. So is this Springleaf Drum, so is this Ornithopter or whatever. There was a couple of cards that they said were warped. Yeah, it was about 15 cards in total of the 60, of 75 card deck. So they said we need you to uh, that the, we we think that you can cut to these cards. We need you to replace them. 
if you can't replace them, you can't. Your deck is not legal because we we think you can cut to them. I said, okay, so you need me to find a replacement to these fifteen cards in the middle of this tournament. They're like, yes, you have. They're like, we'll give you a time extension, but you need to do it now and quickly. And like, luckily, one of the vendors there at the event had all the cards. And they just let me switch them for them real quick. And I gave them back to them at the end of the event. But like, if that wasn't the case, I would have been, you know, disqualified then or whatever, unable to play because of the illegal deck from a deck that I'd been playing for 10 years. So this was logged as an infraction. So you took action to correct the deck yep. uh, with non-foils, but yes. it was still uh, counted as an infraction. Yes. And that counted and is, against this, you. I don't know if that was an infraction that counted towards the end thing. I could probably give an example of a different type of infraction that would be, that would be more similar. Like that one, I, I can't say, but that was an example of one that I thought was unfair and unjust because I literally had played with the cards for 10 years. I know that, the, that they weren't more warped today on the day of this tournament than they were a week ago or a month ago or a year ago. So, yeah. Uh, so that was, but like, um, let's let's go over like a, a gameplay infraction. Um, at uh, the Pro Tour Pro Tour Cons of Tarkir in Hawaii, uh, I was I played and I was playing a uh, it was the limited portion. And I had a morph creature. I was playing a five color deck. And I had a creature face down, a ponyback brigade. It, it cost Mardu colors to flip face up. And I had another morph that was Jeskai colors to flip face up. And I had four colors of mana, but I didn't have the fifth color. And I meant to flip up my ponyback brigade, but instead I flipped up the Jeskai one and I didn't have blue. So I had. Mardu and green, I had those four colors in play, and I meant to flip up Ponyback Brigade to make this block. And instead, I flipped up this Jeskai card. So when I flipped up the Jeskai card, you know, the judge, we called the judge over, and, you know, the judge, they're like, what's wrong? And the, the, my opponent said, well, he tried to flip up the, I forgot, the, I don't know, I don't remember the name of the creature, but the, it cost a color of mana to flip face up that I did not have in play. And my opponent thought that I was flipping it up, like, you know, trying to get one by by flipping uh, it up for the improper mana. So in in the way that the game was resolved was, okay, the creature goes back face down, and you get a, I get a warning for that. And, like, continue the game. So it wasn't an instance of, I didn't get disqualified, I didn't get called a cheater, but, like, those are, those are an example of, like, the infractions that, so you're you're like, saying in that second infraction, or I could also say maybe for the first one too, mm -hmm. it you're you're saying that it was actually just a matter of a mistake or a sloppy play. Yes. And because you understand what you're saying, right? You under, you understand what you're saying is that because you got you got suspended in 2011 and you got the lifetime ban in 2017. There was a three year period where you didn't play, mm -hmm. but you understand what you're saying. You're basically telling me that for those three years that you were actually playing, right? Yes. That you were completely clean and that there was some sort of witch hunt out against you. But you have to understand how this sounds to anybody, including myself right yeah, now. Correct. That like you were just talking about credibility and outing or not outing yes. folks who cheated. Like you understand how this sounds, right? Absolutely. Are you are you asking us to believe that no, I'm not. All asking, the infractions asking, you got in three years were were unwarranted, or they were they were not intentional cheating. Well, I'm not asking. First of all, I'm not asking anyone to believe anything because, again, the the words that I say are the words of a heretic. So it doesn't like I, like I've already mentioned ahead of time. Like it, it's it's not really a witch hunt if you know the person's on a broomstick cackling through the night, right? Like then it's a witch, right? So, I mean, for all intents and purposes, I'm a witch. So the witch hunt is is justified. Um, what I will say is that know that none of the instances and the infractions that I had post ban were documented as cheating. So I wasn't disqualified. I wasn't, there's not some smoking gun on camera or anything like that of the sort. And when people talk about what I get banned for, nobody, I, there isn't, there isn't a thing that got me banned. Like this was saying, there, there isn't a, a post 
Explore and Kira and the 2011 ban, which again, there was plenty of evidence leading up to that ban. There wasn't, there, there wasn't any of that kind of evidence afterwards for me cheating. There was just sloppy play infractions over three years of play where I played every weekend. And other people have similar number of, of sloppy play infractions as well that aren't cheating either. You know, it's, it was a, a, what I would consider a normal amount of infractions. I didn't think I was being, I had more infractions than I should based on how much I was playing. I think that I had a larger number of eyes on me, not, not unwarranted. Like I said, I don't think there was a, I don't think there was a witch hunt. I don't think there was a, a secret cabal out to get me. And I don't think that any of the uh, extreme uh, eyeballs on me were unjustified by any stretch. There were maybe one or two judges that stepped completely out of line, but like of inst of of interacting with hun literally hundreds of judges, there were probably only like two bad actors. I would say the the majority of the the judges were professional and relatively unbiased. However, any normal infraction that people get from playing magic for multiple years at the highest level are going to be looked at in a different lens when the person has been banned for cheating before. For instance, there are currently players that are playing that have plenty of infractions that have cheated in the past that have been banned in the past that have many of infractions that are not currently banned or have not been re-banned afterwards. Um, so the I don't want to say that I was treated unfairly, but at the same time, whether let's say you know if you if play devil's advocate that i wasn't cheating for those three years afterwards let's just say i wasn't it's impossible to digest that fact anyway for 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 you or for anybody else the words don't mean anything to say that i wasn't or was cheating because you've the the mind's already been made up because i did it in the past um i when I got unbanned for magic, all I wanted to do was not get banned again. And the only thing that got me banned the first time was cheating. That's the only reason I got banned was because I cheated. And then not only did I cheat, but I also like approached the, the ban in a very, I would say disrespectful manner. Um, immature. And when I came back, I did not want that to happen again it wasn't that i could create more ingenious ways of cheating that i had never thought of or that i had spent three years thinking about new nefarious ways to get around the judges or think of some new clever scheme that i could do so that hey you know what maybe if i get if i cheat this time i could say this so that i don't get banned again it, it was very obvious that especially with how i responded to the first man that any kind of uh, benefit of the doubt or any kind of caution that people would have, would immediately be thrown away because of the previous history. So when I came back to the game, I wanted to make sure that I didn't cheat <laughs> because that was, that would have been the end. So when they banned me the second time, people are wondering, oh, well, why didn't they ban him for life the second time? You know, and that's a good question because if they think, if they thought that I was cheating, like if they thought that after three years, I was cheat, they banned me for three years. After I came back, if they thought I was cheating, and then they banned me a second time, and it wasn't permanent, um, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know. Like, yeah, you would have to ban the person for life then. The my guess is, and again, I don't, I'm not privy to how they are thinking, but my guess is the reason they didn't ban me for life the second time was because there was a chance that I wasn't cheating. There was a chance that I was just had repeated sloppy play accumulations, like the normal amount, I would say. I, I think that I got the normal amount of sloppy play warnings for how much I played. And I don't have the statistics. I, the only person that would know that would be the DCI. And the, the, the rules committee has probably has a chart of all these players and all the, I don't even know if this department exists anymore with the way the magic is nowadays, but they had a, ta a running tally on all these players. And when you would get an infraction on the back of the match slip, they would write what the infraction was and the details behind it. So if you got a warning for flipping over your morph that you need a blue mana for and you didn't have it for, on the front of the slip, it would say W, next to your name, warning, 
and on the back of the slip, it would say the details of what happened. Player tried to flip over the Jeskai creature when he didn't have blue mana. Opponent caught it and called the judge. Warning was issued. Whatever, that's on the back. And then at the end of the tournament, that's logged for the future, which is a good thing because if you have 10 of these things in your log of, wow, this player has flipped over the morph creature or has tapped inappropriate mana 12 times in the last year, are they really just that bad at figuring out how mana is tapped or are they just trying to cheat? All um, right, let, let, let's just say for the sake of argument mm -hmm. that... Um, Let's say for the sake of argument that they didn't have full confidence that you cheated. And that's why the second time there was another suspension. Sure. If we're going by this obvious line of action or obvious lines, why not come back? Why did you not come back from your first suspension and just go out of your way to just not play with foil cards, to just not even put yourself in the position to be perceived as cheating because like as a tournament player and I, again, everybody's different, right? But I know even though I'm not a cheater, I've never been caught for cheating. I don't plan to, I just don't even want to put myself in that situation. It's stressful to have to replace like four cards or 15 cards during the tournament. And it's stressful to have the reputation of I am Alex Bernchini and everyone's out to get me because I've been suspended and everyone already believes before I even shuffle up my for, for my first match that day that I'm going to cheat. Um, I've heard tons of stories of people just calling judges on you because they just assume you're going to do it. Right. Basically in, uh, guilty before innocent. And you, there's, I'm not, I'm going to put aside whether or not that's justified or not, mm -hmm. but why not? If we're going by this idea of like, do the obvious thing or be extra careful, why not just like, just why not just play less sloppy or just try to not shoot yourself in the foot? That's what I want to know. I, I, I tried. I mean, I, I did try to play less sloppy. I did. Um, yeah, I, I definitely was uh, not playing at my peak performance during my the second time coming back. I definitely still rushed things. I definitely just made honest mistakes. Like, I... Because you understand you're giving people ammunition against you. Right. Yes. And the, the, the ammunition is there and it's always been there. And again, it's it's not the onus was never on me to prove myself as innocent. The, the onus was just on hoping that the uh, community didn't think I was cheating when I wasn't cheating, but that's, that's not the case. And this is one of the reasons why, again, I think it's a losing battle for the judges because you don't want to be the judge that stupidly lets something slide when there's actually cheating going on the same way. You don't want to accuse someone of cheating who just made an honest mistake. And that, that was kind of the heart. That was one of the, the talking points that I had when I was doing the judge seminar was how to differentiate between, which, which I think was the hardest thing for judges to do, how to differentiate between somebody who is cheating versus somebody who made a mistake. Because uh, the cheaters know that their only way of not getting reprimanded from cheating is by playing it off as a mistake. So as a judge, it's very, very important to know how to tell the difference between a mistake and a cheat when possible. It's not always possible, but when possible. Um, and I guess I, looking back, I did not play as as straightforward and as, you know, pen, pen to, pensively as I needed to. I definitely rushed and was sloppy plenty of times. And there are instances on camera of me making mistakes that did not benefit me like <laughs> those aren't the ones that you see in the articles but like there's some on camera where like i bin my own creature when it doesn't die in combat like you know like those things just happen and those aren't talked about very much but there are instances of me playing sloppily not just in my favor every single time because that was an argument that people said they're like oh well yes all of us get warnings and infractions and make sloppy plays but yours are always in your favor and that's just not true. There are many, many instances of examples, and there are some on camera that I could probably find if they're up there still, that are instances where I've made a mistake or made an error where it's not in my favor. But again, those are not the ones that are in the on the YouTube videos. So 
But um, so no, the answer is no. They are not always in my favor, and that is not the case. And um, the infractions also go for failure fa for opponents' infractions that I don't catch. So I don't know. A, a, as a tournament player, you probably know that if you up, if your opponent makes a mistake, and you yeah, don't if catch, you don't if you don't catch their thalia or their yeah. state based effect or whatever. Correct, right, right. There sure. was that was an instance. There was one of those that I got at an SCG tournament where my I, I swords to plowshares my opponent's death right shaman. And they put it in their graveyard. And then, like, a turn later, a spectator was, like, called the judge over, and they're like, he's cheating. And I was, I'm sitting there like, what? And they're like, uh, he put his opponent's death right shaman in the graveyard instead of exile. And, like, the judge was like, oh, well, okay, well, so the judge stopped and corrected it and issued both of us a warning. But, you know, then the judge pulled me over afterwards, and they were like, did you put the creature in their graveyard? I'm like, well, no, I just swordsed it, and they must have picked it up and put it in their own graveyard. I don't think anybody was cheating. I think they just put the dead creature in their graveyard by mistake, even though it was supposed to be an exile. And the judge was like, well, technically, you have cards in your deck that can eat, that can, you have your own death right shamans in your deck, right? And I said, yes. And they're like, so technically, isn't it a benefit for you if your opponent put their death right shaman in their graveyard because then you can eat it with your own death right shaman and gain two life. And I said, well, yes, it's, I guess you could say that it's a benefit for me if my opponent puts it in their graveyard versus exile, because then I can exile, but they also have their own death right shamans. So they can also be a benefit for them because they can exile it with their own. Like, I don't understand. Like, you see what I'm saying? So the, the judge was approaching it like, you know, like, Hmm, like, your the opponent, even though I didn't physically grab their death right shaman and throw it in their graveyard, even though the error was on both of our parts, like yes, I technically should have known it was an exile. It was still speculation that you know, like, are you sure you didn't cheat here? Because technically, you could be advantaged when it's like clearly a, if not a case of very obvious oops, um, it's a case where it's easily a wash where it's beneficial to me or not, whether it's in the graveyard, because we both have death, right? Shamans in our deck. So got it. Right. Like, so, it. Instance, so those instances are not recorded. Like they're not, those aren't typed into the computer. Like, well, this fraction infraction was like kind of just definitely like them playing kind of fast in a blue death, right? Shaman mirror match and legacy that takes 45 minutes. So there's a bunch of brainstorming and pondering going on. And there were a bunch of spectators and they, the person just softly threw it in their graveyard. No, no, that's not how it's recorded. It's recorded as, Player did not put the card in the proper zone. Warning. Don't do it again. Or, well, look at our computer. He's done that three times this year. And he's been banned before. He's probably cheating. Duh. Like, you know what I mean? So that the context is removed when looking at it from the committee, from, from the rules committee. And like I said, I think, again, I can't speak for them. I'm not part of the rules committee. I don't know how they think and operate. I would suspect that if they thought I was cheating after my first ban in the three years before they gave me my second ban, I would assume they would just ban me for life. Because clearly three years of reflection on my actions and repentance or whatever it is, clearly three years of it did not work because I came right back in and started cheating at the highest level. That's what I would assume. So again, maybe maybe they just really liked me. I don't know what, what to say, but I I think that if they both beyond beyond if they thought beyond a reasonable doubt that I was cheating again, they should have banned me for good. All right. Um, another another question I want to ask is um, the first time you were suspended, you wrote a pretty detailed Facebook post that explained what was going through your your mind as you committed the the cheats mm -hmm. right and that page was eventually taken out or deleted or you did something with it like when did you delete the the post so i made that post no what year was it it was right before the the last ban that's all i remember it was like around that time um Oh, so it was like around 2017 or 2016. Yes, it was right in there. Right, it was. It was not long before I got the final ban because that was eventually the the impetus for me removing it was just getting banned. Um, the the last time, the reason I wrote it was to kind of just 
tell my story and make a statement. The the uh, so you were making an appeal to the public. Is that what it was? It was less of an appeal because at that point I certainly knew there was no appeal to be made. Like I mean, the public already had its opinion, still does, and always will have its opinion about me. It is not going to change. It will never change, and I have made more than my peace with that. So <laughs> to any anybody who's going to start typing out the the long threads tomorrow, it. it couldn't bother me less at this point, but at that time, I w it wasn't necessarily an appeal. It was more just an explanation because until that point, I hadn't had any. I hadn't publicly talked about any of it. I didn't make any statements after the first ban, and I didn't make any statements after the second ban. So it was complete radio silence for me regarding all of it because, you know, over over the years, I didn't think it was fruitful to talk about it. But leading up to that point. I, there was some situations that were happening and there was some ways that I was being treated in the tournaments that I felt that I needed to discuss and talk about because at this point it had been getting a little out of hand. Like I, the, the judge calls were getting more, um, I know it sounds crazy to say the more, more outlandish. Okay. I know, like I said, it's like, it's, it's so funny to call it's not, I don't want to call it a witch hunt because I, I don't really think it's a witch. Hunt. I think witch hunts, it's like, it's, poorly phrased for this because a witch hunt is more like when witches don't exist but in this case i was a witch slash in the people's eyes i am still a witch so it's not really like it's not really unjustified but a lot of the situations especially with the one or two judges that were making unfair calls towards me um i felt like i needed to to speak Okay, so you needed to tell you wanted to tell your side of things. Yeah. That's why you posted. Correct. Okay, yeah. so why did you why did you take the post down and when exactly did that happen? I took the post down after I got the uh, after I got banned the uh, the last time. Um, this this time, unlike the previous bans, I didn't have any uh, correspondence from wizards or any emails. Um, I found out like the morning of, like everybody else did. Like usually. Pre prior to the to the ban going up on the uh, there was a public list at one point I don't think it's up anymore but there was a public list of players who were banned the dates that they were banned and the reason they were banned it used to be all public information and prior to that list being updated I and I'm assuming other players were emailed by wizards saying by the way you're going to be banned for this date and this date and this is the reason why you were banned so that happened in 2011. And that happened in uh, 2014 or whatever it was the second time I got banned. They sent me an email as well, saying stating that I was banned for the repeated infractions. And then the third time, they there was no email, there was no appeal process. It was just uh, a ban. Uh, and the online it said uh, lifetime or whatever it was indefinite ban. So at that point, I didn't feel like I needed to have my perspective and point of view out there anymore because it didn't, it, it, it the, the mind was already made up. I figured people's mind was already made up anyway, but I just wanted to at least have it, have it on paper at my official statement out there. So I think it was all just kind of in like the, in the, it wasn't like a thing that I thought about much. Like, hmm, should I remove this from the internet forever? Like, it's not going to be removed. It's still up there. I'm sure you can find it with three clicks. But I took it down just because it was not serving its purpose of just talk, is stating me stating my piece. I didn't figure. Did you did you make any statements after the the permanent lifetime ban mm, publicly? No, not regret. No. Why Why did you not try to? appeal or fight for being reinstated because especially given what you told me over the last little bit which is that you felt like you were not cheating and that there was some sort of effort to to get you so did you not make any case at all to the dci or to the public about that i find that hard to understand in a way yeah um so the the last the last ban the, the last, the final, the final. final. It, was, yes. it was over. I, it was, I understood. Uh, it, funny enough, I didn't need the, uh, the email to know. Uh, why. Because there was no heads up that you knew that it was a done deal. Correct. I, there so you didn't, you didn't try to fight it at any way. You didn't try to make a case. No. In any shape. No. Or I form. made no further attempts. I made no statements after that final ban. None. Because okay. it, it, 
I understood the it was you know it, this was this was right after the so the, the 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 statement that I made was right after a Grand Prix that I top aided in Los Angeles, which is where I was living. Uh, I, I played in a Grand Prix, and during this Grand Prix, there was a series of you know the 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 atmosphere from the professional from many of the professional players was very hostile. The you know when I made the top eight, um, when they made the announcement, I was booed very loudly in the hall. So like there was definitely a large shift in like, uh, like I said, like there was always disdain and and hatred for me playing the game post ban, and there were lots of instances of certain professionals and players being very hostile and aggressive towards me as well understandably so or whatever maybe deservedly so maybe but after that after that uh event you know and me doing well and and top four in that grand prix i made the statement and then i donated the the prize money all of it to charity to gamers helping gamers whatever the john finkel chris pakula one and i have the receipt and all that stuff i just donated 100 percent of the money and it was you know some people call it a publicity stunt, but to me, it was just to show that I was playing the game because I wanted to keep playing, and I wasn't trying to gain monetary benefit from it. Like, I literally donated all the money, including expenses, everything. The, the entire paycheck that I got from Top Fouring the Grand Prix donated right to charity because, to me, it was just showing that I was, like, even if you... Let's just say you thought I cheated to, to Top 8 the Grand Prix. Let's just say you thought I cheated. Like, at least all the money was donated to charity. Like, I wasn't trying to steal money or opportunity from anybody in the room. And the response, again, the response to that was just, the, the response to everything about me doing well in the event was extremely, extremely negative. The response to me donating the money was extremely negative. Like, it was all seen like an agenda, like a plot. Me talking to the judges and trying to tell judges how to catch cheaters, plot. Me donating the money, plot. Me showing up and playing at the event at all, a scheme, a plot, all of it. So, like, to me, I knew it was already over. There was no, whatever the next infraction I got, whatever whatever I did, whether I did anything at all, it was just going to be curtains. So, so you're saying that you thought it was time. Like, you, you just thought that at this point, there's no, there's no return. Right. So when I wrote, right. So when I, and especially after I made the statement, that was, I immediately knew this. I released a statement like right after the Grand Prix because of the response I got to the Grand Prix, like was, you know, one of the, was the final reason to make me actually make the statement. I was like, maybe people just don't understand. Maybe I need to like write some things to like explain that like, but uh, it was like, looking back on it, I, I, I don't, I, I regret even writing it at all because you know, I guess it solidified your your thought, which you told me earlier today, which is like people have their minds made up. That's what you're saying. Yes, they they ha people have their minds made up. They always have their will have their minds made up, and it's it it's completely regardless of what I say or what I do going forward. It it, it completely irrelevant. Like one of the interesting things that I've noticed is that it's it's almost like I'm not even like a person. Like it's almost like I'm not like an idea or like this uh, figurehead. Yeah. But, but you understand. And I, and I, and I understand we all have our own um, reality, right? I'm mm -hmm. not trying to suggest otherwise, but you understand that by not fighting harder with the final lifetime, ban, that I understand what you're saying just now that you, you thought you were done. Like the community had cast you out. So you didn't want to, participate there's a part of that but you do understand that by not fighting harder you sort of gave your haters or people who were against you even more ammunition like hey i i knew it right so like did that not cross your mind at all or especially yeah. after like the the amount of time that's passed no you know? and it still to this moment doesn't cross my mind because i don't think it's like it's it's such a effort of futility it's um like, if I went down swinging, I was going down swinging because I wanted to cheat y'all some more. Not because I wanted to clear my name, not because I wasn't cheating and was just being crucified. No, it was because I just needed to cling on to whatever last scrap would let me get away with it. Just like I did my entire magic career, which was like playing to every small edge or advantage. So 
if I had made stated my case again and really, you know, went appeal, 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 no, don't do this, don't do this, you guys have it all wrong, every single one of you, all of you thousands and thousands of people that agree on the same thing are all wrong, trust me, you're all wrong, like, you have it, it it's just completely, utterly useless, like, it's, it would not have been seen as a, well, this is what an innocent man would do versus this is what a guilty man would do, it would be seen as that scumbag <laughs> lock them up right, right but 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 you, but you understand right because i i one way that i could interpret what happened is like hey y'all think i'm the villain well i'm just going to lean into being the villain mm. i part of me want like after the first band part of me that that was kind of my approach that was how it was i kind of laughed and jeered it off because i didn't think that I thought that that was the best way to thing to do about it. I didn't think that contrition was the appropriate way of presenting myself. And I could have been because I was young and, you know, whatever, I was 20, 21 years old, 22 years old or whatever, when I got unbanned. Uh, I don't know. It was, tw yeah, it was early 20s or something like that. I didn't, I, I initially did lean into that to, to, being the villain that they all wanted me to be kind of thing. But in the end, there was no, there was no salvation. Like I said, it was it, at the end of the day, it didn't matter whether I cheated or not. Like do you, wizards didn't care either. Like players didn't care. Like they, in their mind, it was already made up. But even if I, even if I wasn't the damage and negative image that I had on the game was already the worst. Like for instance, the grand prix that I top aided, the final event that I played, the, the only discussion point of the entire tournament was me top eight in the Grand Prix. Like, what decks made the top eight didn't matter. Who was who won the event didn't matter. What like none of that was mattered. All was in the Twitch chat was just oh my god, oh my god oh my. you know like it was just like it was like the what right. you know like, it'll be the event that Alex top eighted. That's correct, it. correct, and that would be the next event that I top eighted as well, and the one after that. It was just that that that's all it would be about, and that's all that would be, and it was just not a good look. So. At the end of the day, hopefully people can even realize that it didn't. It doesn't really matter whether I cheated or not. Like, like if if we one hundred percent beyond a reasonable doubt somehow could know that I didn't cheat at that event, it wouldn't matter. It, the, the the perception was the same. There wasn't this uproar because I was caught cheating in the event. It was, and if I was, you would have heard about that. <laughs> like that's what I say. That's one of the funny parts that people always are like, man, you know, like if I tell people that I didn't cheat after that first band, I was like, if if I cheated you would know about all of these instances and you would, there, there would be a good trail of information about it, uh, about these instances, but there isn't any, and they certainly weren't brought up to me by wizards. Wizards didn't send me, you know, with the first time they, they mentioned the, the things that got me banned. And then they, they said that repeated infractions, but like there wasn't a, Oh yes. And this time that you tapped, uh, you didn't tap your blue mana because you didn't have blue mana and you flipped over a blue creature at the pro tour. Like, you know, like they, they didn't, <laughs> the specific examples were, weren't, were, were omitted because presumably it wasn't for a specific example. Like it was the first time where I played the extra land on camera or I returned the Kira to my hand on camera, or I played a sideboard card in my main deck on coverage. So it's one of those, if, if there was solidified, verified examples of me cheating after that point they would be solidified and out there on the internet this is what happened not a bunch of like, random this and this and that oh yeah he, he did this this time or oh he did that this time or you know like it's um and that's again it's a, a lesson in futility and that's kind of what it would sound like if i went tomorrow and started talking about a bunch of pro players that cheated eight years ago at a star city games event it would sound kind of like a guy in the Reddit thread being like, oh, yeah, and Alex did this, too. Also, yeah, and he also did this. And, yeah, like, I was there when he did this thing. Like, it, it's not it, – unfortunately, you can't verify anything. So it's it's kind of like, you know, who is the message being delivered by? How credible is it, you know? Like, if, if I – again, the Reed Duke thing. If I said Reed Duke did this, 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 and this, and then Reed Duke came out and was like, I didn't do any of those things, the internet would be like, oh, see, we knew it. He didn't do any of those things. You see, guys, Phew. like he, he Reed said it himself, you know, like, so, yeah, I've learned 
over the years of like because I again like I tried for the first two bands I have I have the emails I can send you I have detailed listed out emails of me trying very hard to not to to to, to flip the band and to like say can I get a reduced band you know or the second time when I got banned the second time I messaged them and I was like listen these in repeated infractions I wasn't cheating like these these were instances where I was being monitored more than average more than the average player i was being monitored so every single play in every single tournament that i played in was watched so like and i still wasn't disqualified like i was still never banned for cheating in any of these so these are mostly just innocent honest mistakes that like normal players make over the course of time and if you're familiar with tournament magic all players have tournament infractions it's just a matter of how much you play if you play every single weekend every single month of every single year you're gonna have more infractions and for that year i had was number one in planeswalker points for that season so i had played more magic than everybody in the world number two was martin juza number three was shuhei nakamura number one was me so i played more magic than any other human being recorded in the world that year so i'm going to have more infractions just because i played literally more magic it's on it's on paper you know so it's um it, it's one of those situations where i I've learned, I, I just, I can understand why, where they're coming from. I understand they're a company. Like, it's, you know, snuff out this guy who's just not good for the game. Like, there's no question in my mind that as soon as I got banned the first time, I was no longer good for the game. I was active, actively bad for it. Cheating or not. Helping the judges or not. Doesn't matter. Didn't matter. Because to everybody, and it's almost like you'd be silly not to think I was cheating, right? Like, if... If, if for, I look at it from my point of view, if I was playing against a person that I knew had multiple that had been banned multiple times, and they're playing against me, and they're playing with me for, against me for thousands of dollars, you know what I'm going to think? I'm going to think they're cheating, and I should think they're cheating because it's in my best interest to make sure that they are not cheating me. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they write online. I don't care what if some of their friends be like, oh well, it's probably. I don't care what they say. I'm going to make sure that they're not cheating against me. I'm going to think that they're cheating. So it's it, at that point, it was it's just. I, there was no further effort to be done by me, in my opinion. Let me leave you with one uh, one last question sure. here. It's been a few years. It's been five, six years since the lifetime ban. Is there anything on top of what you said that you you would like to just say as a message to the the community, whatever is left of the the folks that are that are following you or care about what Alex is up to? I mean, a lot of time has passed by, half a decade. What would you say to others or maybe even to yourself? Let's see, I would say um, to, to players that are playing, at, you know, trying to play at the professional level, like trying to do kind of what I did. Um, I think that uh, during that time, a lot of players were inspired by the... Uh, by the players that were playing on the SCU circuit because they were we were kind of just like the everyday player that would just that could show that you could make it in the game just if you played a lot. I would say to the players that are trying to play competitive magic or you know just get better at it to be careful because not only is the game full of unexpected, you know, for the better or worse, you know, there's a lot of unexpected peril playing a game for a living. Um I think that we are past the time where it's possible for magic at all. Uh, I think that if you want to make money from Magic the Gathering, you have to do content creation. And that is different than being a professional Magic player. They're two very different skills. One is an entertainer job and one is a gaming job. And I think, unfortunately, uh, it's sad news to me, but I, it's unfortunate, but I don't think that that era exists as a palpable thing for Magic. And I think that one of the one of the reasons that I... And the, the bottom line reasons that I cheated, one of the biggest things, regardless of what you think of me or my characteristics or personality traits, um, one of the, the biggest reasons was just incredible stress and incredible pressure to perform and do well. Um, maybe not even, not necessarily monetarily, but even just f from a social level. So to anybody out there who's trying to play a game for a living, even if it's poker, magic any other game uh esports you know video games understand that there's going to be a lot of temptations to do a lot of things because of the societal monetary or other or you know pressure from your peers and your friends 
you know, pressure from within to perform, to do well, to, you know, be able to respect yourself and be very careful about giving up, you know, the person that you want to be. So for instance, myself, I wanted to always prove to myself and others, of course, I wanted validation from other people, but I always wanted to prove to myself that I could be good at the game, that I could play magic at the highest level, that I could make a living from it, that I could do it consistently for time, for a certain period of time. That's one something I always wanted to prove to myself. And by cheating, I not only stole from other people, uh, but I also stole from myself. I stole a lot of opportunities from myself, uh, opportunities that I'll never get back from magic or elsewhere, uh, friendships that I've lost. And in the end, it did the opposite of prove to myself that I could play. And it tainted many of my wins to other people and tainted many of my wins to myself. So I guess a word of caution would be to try not to <laughs> fall into those temptations despite incredible stress and pressure. I suggest doing something other than magic for a living is my honest suggestion. So you don't have that exact kind of stress and life is going to be stressful regardless, but be very careful with uh, giving into those things. And I guess as a statement for people who are interested in my life, um, over the years, it's been a lot of trying to figure out, you know, exactly, you know, as you can see from what I was saying here today, I don't have a concrete 100% reason why I did it. I can't remember the first time I cheated. I can't remember when the light switch was on and off the exact moment it happened, it kind of just happened and I became comfortable with it. I would say that I wasn't, I still maintain that I wasn't, and I'm not compulsive about it, as in like it was a, an addiction to cheating or anything like that. But at the same time, it was something that I was comfortable enough doing that it was something I didn't need to actively have a morality crisis with when I was doing it. I'd never had to sit there and cheat thinking, all right, well, how is this going to affect the people around me? How is this going to affect my future? How is this going to affect those conversations never happened uh, before, after, or during a tournament where I cheated. So it, and looking back on it, it's kind of scary because I think to myself, wow, uh, if I, you know, I've, I've tried to be very cognizant of all the actions I take nowadays, game and in life and otherwise, and try and be very in tune with why I'm doing certain things and why I should or shouldn't do something from a, you know, personal morals and, you know, ethics point of view. So, you know, I guess that, that, that would be my uh, statement there. <laughs> All right, Alex, thank you for uh, taking the time today to talk to me. I really, uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, James. I really appreciate you giving me the ability to talk, and uh, thanks for asking the questions. Thank you for listening to Humans of Magic. You've made it to the end. Thanks so much. You're awesome. If you'd like to support the show, there are two ways to do so. The first way is the most powerful. Tell a friend. Tell them to check out Humans of Magic. I'd love it if you could spread the word. The second way is to join the Humans of Magic Patreon at patreon.com slash humans of magic. Patreon is the best way to directly support the show from a financial perspective. For as little as $2 a month, you can support me and join the Discord. It gives me the power to keep cranking out new episodes with your favorite magic people. If you want to go the $5 support route, you'll get a digital copy of the Humans of Magic book. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you as always making it all the way to the end and we'll see you next time.